So the first speaker is Dr. Shah, the Commissioner of the Department of Health. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Farrell, DeFrancisco, Hannon and Gottfried, Senators Rivera and Breslin, and Assembly Members Rea and Oaks, and all of the colleagues here today. I'm Dr. Nirav Shah, Commissioner of the New York State Department of Health, and I'm pleased to join you today to share Governor Andrew Cuomo's executive budget as it relates to the Department of Health. It's been three years since the state embarked on its historic Medicaid reforms, led by Governor Cuomo's Medicaid redesign team. As discussed in his State of the State address, New York has achieved remarkable improvements in Medicaid as a result of the work of the MRT, both in terms of quality and reduced expenditures. In the first year alone, New York's taxpayers saved $2.2 billion. Over the next five years, we anticipate that the federal government and the state will save a total of $34 billion as a result of these reforms. But our work is far from done. To meet the goals of the triple aim, better population health, better quality, and lower cost, we must build on these successes and continue to transform the entire healthcare delivery system of New York. And the challenges we face are substantial. In particular, our health care delivery system is imbalanced. It relies too heavily on inpatient, inpatient care, emergency room services, and nursing home care, and not enough on primary care or community-based services. We have struggling safety net providers throughout the state, and some are in danger of closing and placing even basic health care access at risk. Nowhere is this more pronounced than in Brooklyn. Several hospitals there are in dire financial uh, straits and on the verge of closure. Our roadmap to meet these challenges and achieving the vision of the triple aim is the State Health Innovation Plan, the SHIP, we call it. The plan was developed last year by the state in partnership with stakeholders from across the system with groups representing consumers, payers, and providers. The SHIP recognizes the diverse needs of New Yorkers, attributes and resources across the state, and concludes that regional innovation is required to achieve optimal health for all New Yorkers. The state will establish 11 regional health improvement collaboratives, or RICs, which will actively engage stakeholders, analyze data, and develop strategies that align healthcare resources with population health needs. The work of the RICs will be based on the best practices identified by the Finger Lakes Health Systems Agency, a successful model of regional planning for almost two decades in the Rochester region. They've done a lot in Rochester. They now have been scoring in the top 10% nationwide as in terms of health system performance as measured by the Commonwealth Fund's local report card. They have the lowest overall Medicare spending rate in the nation with reductions in acute hospital inpatient use and among the highest quality anywhere in the state. The promise of regional planning is to take what we've learned in Rochester and to spread it throughout the state. But the transformation of New York State's health system requires federal support as well. We've asked them to approve our Medicaid redesign team waiver amendment submitted 18 months ago. The waiver will continue on the work of MRT by reinvesting $10 billion in federal Medicaid savings back into our healthcare delivery system over a five-year period. Of that amount, half a billion dollars will be used to support health homes. $2.1 billion will be directed to improving primary care, behavioral health, and workforce initiatives. And the third component of the waiver is the state's Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Plan, or the DISRIP plan, which aims to reduce avoidable hospital use by 25% over the next five years and help to rebalance the state's healthcare delivery system and stabilize the healthcare safety net. In particular, 
This funding will allow the safety net providers to downsize unneeded inpatient capacity and adjust their mix of services while providing lower cost, higher quality alternatives to emergency room care. In short, the waiver is fundamental to our transformation agenda. But federal funding is not enough. The feds will not allow waiver funds to be used for bricks and mortar. Therefore, Governor Cuomo's budget will establish a $1.2 billion capital restructuring financing program, which will pay for construction projects that enhance quality, financial viability, and efficiency of the healthcare delivery system. The budget will also expand eligibility for the health facility restructuring loan pool, currently only available to general hospitals, to include not-for-profit nursing homes and diagnostic and treatment centers. In addition, the budget authorizes the creation of a pilot program that would allow up to five corporations approved by the Public Health and Health Planning Council to invest private equity in hospitals. Taken together, these programs will enable the state to assist facilities and help them to empower themselves in restructuring their operations and finances so they can improve the healthcare delivery system and ultimately improve patient care. Improving patient care will also require integrating the statewide Health Information Network New York, the SHINee, with New York's all-payer claims database, the APD. The SHINee is a secure network that shares clinical patient data so that healthcare providers responsible for a patient's care will know the patient's medical history. In the all-payer claims database, stores data from all major public and private payers in one integrated network. And taking these two networks together will result in more coordinated care, higher quality care, and lower cost care for New Yorkers. It will give us the population health tools we need to transform New York State. In his executive budget proposal, Governor Cuomo identifies a bold new approach to the organ donation crisis referred to in his State of the State Address. The department will engage in a public-private partnership regarding the operation and promotion of the New York Donate Life Registry. New York is also leading the nation and the world in committing to the end of the AIDS epidemic. Today, approximately 130,000 New Yorkers are diagnosed and living with HIV or AIDS. We are still the center of the epidemic. But our efforts to end the AIDS epidemic have combined prevention, testing, and effective treatments to produce a significant drop in new cases. In 2013, preliminary numbers show that we had only two cases of mother-to-child transmission out of over 240,000 live births. This is incredible. The success of our programs reflects our close and productive working relationship with strong community partners who have long been a voice for these vulnerable populations. I'd like to now spend a few minutes updating you on the activities of the department since we last met. As you are all aware, I am still in the process of reviewing the science on hydrofracking. I am sure that the science will be reflected in my final recommendations, but the process must be done carefully, deliberately, and with objectivity. In October, New York State opened its health plan marketplace, the New York State of Health, allowing New Yorkers to shop for and enroll in high-quality, affordable health plans. Health plans of the New York State of Health are on average 53% less expensive than what individuals paid for last year. 16 health insurers are offering health plan coverage to individuals, and 10 also offer plans to small businesses throughout New York's marketplace. As of today, over 650,000 people have completed applications on our marketplace, and 380,000 are enrolled in high-quality health plans. Last year, we worked together to pass Aiden's Law in the enacted budget, which added a test for adrenal leukodystrophy, 
a rare genetic brain disorder. Today, that test has been successfully added to our newborn screening panel, bringing to a total of 46 the number of tests in New York's panel. We are the first state in the nation to screen for this condition. Opioid addiction and abuse have become major public health problems. Thanks to you, our partners in the legislature, and the adoption of the I Stop legislation last year, the department has been a leader in the fight against prescription drug abuse. Since the law took effect on August 27, the prescription monitoring program has processed more than 6 million searches from over 65,000 healthcare professionals. And this is up from only half a million searches by 6,000 providers over the prior three and a half years. The numbers of individuals engaged in doctor shopping have dropped by 75%. Without a doubt, iStop is something that we can all be proud of. Many of the people who successfully rolled out the iStop program are working with the same supervision to Governor Cuomo's plans to allow the advancement and research of medical marijuana in a framework that prevents diversion and abuse. We have actively engaged hospitals around the state, have had several meetings and ongoing meetings planned for the next few months, and there is a lot of interest in this program. The executive budget reflects Governor Cuomo's commitment to serve the taxpayers in New York while making strategic investments and reforms in our health care delivery system that will help all New Yorkers. The Department of Health looks forward to working with you closely to make sure that the interests of the people of New York and the health care delivery system continue to advance throughout the year. Thank you. I'm very happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the first questioner is uh, Chair of the Health Committee in the Senate, uh, Senator Kemp Hannon. <coughs> Good morning, Doctor. Thank you. Um, I want to begin with some broader based questions and when the, my colleagues have uh, gone through uh, their thoughts and shared with you, I'll, I'll come back and get some more detail. One of the, the greater, um, and so I, I just asked you to comment on this, one of the greater uh, news stories of the whole year, of obviously, has been the implementation of the Affordable Care Act uh, in New York State. And to a large extent, New York has been successful in the mechanics and has rolled that out well. But I was very surprised in the budget proposal to read a request for appropriations in terms of several uh, millions of dollars. And I was very surprised because the uh, representation to the legislature had been that the exchange in New York would be on, run on a self-sustaining basis when the federal subsidies had been exhausted. And I can just ask, what happened to that? And uh, is there really an expectation that uh, New Yorkers are going to have to subsidize this federal program? So as you know, the exchange has been funded by over $400 million of federal funding to date, and we anticipate continuing to receive federal funding. Uh, perhaps even an application may go in in February for the next round, and other states have successfully managed to continue to fund their exchanges through this year. We're looking for about uh, $150 million total, uh, $28 million from HICRA and other sources that will help continue to fund the exchange. There are uh, startup costs associated with the exchange. As you know, with enrollments so high and so fast, we've had to hire more people in, in some ways than we anticipated. But ultimately, it will be self-sustaining to the extent that the funding required to fund the exchange does not require new funds. It's just as folks have expanded their eligibility to insurance plans, for example, the HICRA funds grow. Those fundings are being used. It's been within our projections, within our uh, rounding error, to the extent that ultimately we'll have to be funded. 158 is a rounding error? When you have a six, uh, you know, a $120 five billion dollar health care delivery system in New York and we enroll 350,000 people uh, in the first few months alone. We're not even up to March 31st. A few million here and there, 28 million is within the rounding error of a six billion dollar HICRA pool. That's, that's the rounding error. It's not the, yeah, it's a lot of money. It is real money, but it is needed for successful implementation of the exchange and continued enrollment. 
I have concerns about the self-sustaining aspect of it. I have major concerns about tapping into what is known as HICRA, which is a health care reform act, which was designed to uh, help the providers of, a healthcare, of our health care system in the state. And not only do I have concerns about doing it for the exchange, because it's a change in course, I then have concerns about taking money out of HICRA to the tune of 75 to $95 million a year for information technology that may be otherwise provided in any, any event. So those are big concerns. Um, and that's all to do with the state of New York's information exchange uh, implementation. One of the other things that uh, great concern to me is the waiver. Not because it's, frankly, the state has earned it, the state has saved money, the federal government should share it, but this is an elusive waiver which about 12 months ago changed its purposes. And you, you repeat it again, and I don't know if the world of New York healthcare understands it, but it's designed to cut hospital admissions by 25% in five years. And um, uh, Medicaid Director Helgerson, when he made that presentation, said 10% over 10, uh, no, 50% over 10 years. So um, I don't know if the throes of concern that we're going through about hospitals in this state what's going to be kept open, what's partially going to be closed, what's entirely going to be closed, is how that meets up with cutting that many admissions to, to hospitals. And so I think there's, there's a need to have a greater public discussion as to where we're going with that. Um, the last general point I want to make is the oft-touted and unexplained global cap. There is last year's budget, the years before, uh, the implementation of a cost uh, holding measure, but I think it is time in our third year of implementing this cap, maybe it's the fourth year, depending on how much we've reached back, <clears throat> is explaining what the cap is, explaining where the actual costs are going to be saved, explaining where the increase, there's a, almost a 4% increase in Medicaid, where that money is going to go, who's going to receive that money, how it's going to be allocated, and in the same way looking for the previous 12 months as to what happened to the increases. The whole concept of the cap has really been uh, put in many minds into doubt when the state budget absorbed a $1.2 billion deficit cut in federal developmentally disabled reimbursement last spring. And we were told we had done so well with the cap that we could just accept it. Well, I'm not so sure anybody saw the shells as they moved around. But I think in terms of budget credibility and policy, uh, we need to have a far better explanation than uh, what we've had before. And let me point out, when the legislature asks for an explanation, and I see what is, what's given to our fiscal staffs, I don't believe PowerPoints are sufficient. Um, I know it's a convenient mode of communication in this modern world, but when you're doing budget with the exp ex large amount of money that you're talking about, I think we need more than PowerPoints. We'll be sure to brief you appropriately. Thank you, Senator. We've been joined by Senators Kathy Young and Betty Little. And Ruth Hassel Thompson and Cecilia Katrick. And we've been joined by Assemblyman Phil Stack, Assemblyman Joey Lentall, and Assemblyman Kay Hill. As well as Assemblyman Rayak. First to, to question Chairman Godfrey. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Um, you mentioned in your testimony the governor's proposal relating to medical marijuana activating the, uh, the 1980 statute. Uh, I have a few questions. You have said that the medical marijuana initiative will be clinical research. Uh, is that what is usually meant, meaning research on the safety and effectiveness of a drug or a, or a therapeutic uh, intervention uh, with randomized and controlled groups, specific outcomes being measured and, uh, and follow-ups? Or is it research on how to run uh, a production and distribution system? And you know, the 1980 law is rooted in getting uh, the approval of the, of the FDA, the DEA, or the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Is there any evidence that they will approve, quote, clinical research, unquote, on the effectiveness of a production and distribution system? And how will the department 
get the specialized strains of marijuana and, and non-leaf uh, products that many patients need uh, and pay for all this. Uh, and you mentioned, it seemed like you were saying that the iStop system was going to apply to the medical marijuana system, but the iStop statute is dependent on a prescription and under federal law, it is illegal to write a prescription for a, control, a, a Schedule One controlled substance. So I don't understand how iStop can be used here uh, without statutory amendment. Uh, and I guess my bottom line is, uh, given the governor's recognition of the need for action here, uh, will the governor be willing to work with the legislature uh, to enact uh, really comprehensive and workable legislation in this area. Thank you for your questions. Um, starting with the research. Uh, research does not always have to be a randomized controlled trial. Research can also involve things like observational studies, pre-post. You follow a patient over time. You understand their pain scores and other scores at the baseline and see how they change over time. So research can be thought of broadly uh, in, in many ways. And since 1999, the federal government has approved 15 INDs, investigational new drug applications for medical marijuana use. So the feds have a process in place. They have worked with uh, numerous parties to actually begin and engage in research of this Schedule I substance. The, the opportunity of doing this under the existing law is that this will be part of the therapeutic continuum offered to patients. Hospitals around the state are very excited under federal guidance according me, to the I, law. I apologize for interrupting, but will the research be therapeutic research on the effectiveness of, a, of, the, of the drug, or is what is being researched how to design a production and the former. And distribution system. The former, not the latter. Not about a distribution system. The research is about the effectiveness. Do patients with certain end-stage cancers benefit? If so, how much? What are the bounds of the kinds of patients that benefit? How do we continue to provide evidence showing that this should be part of the armamentarium of, uh, of drugs that physicians prescribe? Not only in New York, but ultimately, our goal is that the evidence that we provide will be of such high value and done at the statewide level will be enough for the country. Okay, I, I don't think that's what the governor said in the state of the state speech, but okay. Uh, speaking to um, iStop, you, you mentioned that this, uh, what I mentioned in my remarks was that the same folks who had been working on iStop are also the same folks who will be working on some of this program, parts of this program. So we are confident that we have the right people who have a track record of success, who know how to work with state, federal, and local partners from a law uh, enforcement side, from a hospital side, from a distribution side, to make sure that this program rolls out effectively on time. As you remember, iStop rolled out two months early, before its deadline. So we're very aggressive of moving forward with the existing statutes we have on the books to make this a success. Um, and as you, you may have heard, uh, Larry Schwartz just uh, two, uh, two weeks ago, or last week on, on uh, the radio, mentioned that we are willing to work with the legislature uh, to, uh, with whatever is presented to the governor on his desk. Uh, we are working with the tools we have at hand, which is this 1980 bill, and we are going to make it work. If there are other things that uh, uh, appear on our desk, we will absolutely make them work as well. Uh, if I can focus in on that last reference, are you saying that you are willing to work with the legislature to pass a bill, or are you saying that if the legislature passes a bill, you're not committed to vetoing it, you'll look at it? I don't want to talk about hypotheticals because I don't have a bill in front of me. I've seen other versions of bills, but I need to see one that passes both houses. Uh, and to the extent that we have something that we think we can work with very well today, I'm focusing all my energy on making sure that we have the medical marijuana program up and running within a year 
to meet New Yorkers' needs. The problem is other programs that look for other distribution systems or, or, or other ways of uh, setting up regulatory structures may not be out there and up and running within a year. My goal is to get this up and running as soon as possible and using federal sources for product, we can get it up and running within a year. And patients who need something other than basically street grade dried leaf, how will that be obtained? So we will work with whatever strains the feds have available, and we will work, uh, they have by law, they have to uh, provide whatever is needed. So to the extent that there is a, a greater need, it's incumbent on the feds to make sure that the need is met. Um, do, there do are they? other strains, there are, uh, for example, NYU is uh, recruiting patients, uh, children with a rare form of epilepsy who need a different strain that is available by the feds uh, that you may have heard of. Um, that, uh, and there are other protocols around which uh, are enrolling patients for other research is, protocols. Is the federal government producing oil extract of the so-called Charlotte's Web strain? Is Not that what that you're saying? Of. Not that I'm aware of. That's what I thought. Okay. Uh, the budget seems to propose that it will be illegal for Medicaid to pay for a prescription for essentially the off-label use of a drug. It says it won't pay if, if a drug is being prescribed for a condition other than one that is uh, med a medically accepted indication as defined by federal law, which I think is a long way of saying off-label. Um, now, doctors prescribe drugs for off-label use thousands of times a day in this state quite legally. Is there a growing body of medical opinion seeking to outlaw off-label prescribing of drugs? And is the administration proposing only to apply this proposition to Medicaid patients and their physicians? Or might the administration try to prohibit my doctor from prescribing a drug for an off-label use since uh, my prescriptions are paid for uh, by public employee benefits? That's a good question. You know, remember that today medical marijuana is a Schedule One substance. Me, this isn't a medical marijuana question. This is a question about drugs that are being prescribed for an off-label use. Uh, for example, a drug that may have been tested on adults but has not been specifically approved for children. Uh, or drugs that may have been tested for and approved for one kind of cancer, but doctors every day prescribe it for other kinds of cancers. Uh, and there are an endless list of examples of uses of off-label drugs. Uh, the budget proposes that this would now be illegal under Medicaid. Uh, there is language in that paragraph about prior authorization, but there are no criteria for the prior authorization. And the language doesn't say that if you get prior authorization, that overrides the prohibition on Medicaid paying for the prescription. So my question is, where does this come from? What is the body of medical opinion that supports this prohibition? And is the administration looking to extend this prohibition uh, to public employee health benefits? Great question. So to the extent that when the FDA approves a drug for a given indication, Medicaid automatically covers it. That's the standard. Oftentimes, physicians will use medications off-label. That means, for example, it was proven in adults, hasn't been proven in kids. They'll cut it in half and give a, a half a pill to a kid, something like that, right? To the extent that that's a practice, practice over time that has helped many patients, it's been helpful. But now what we're seeing is that more and more, oftentimes, when a pharmaceutical does get an indication, they try to get as broad an indication as possible. They want to cover as many patients as possible. When there are instances of off-label use, more and more what we're seeing is that it is actually not necessarily in the interest of the patient. 
There may be side effect profiles. There may be other drugs that should be tried first. And what we're trying to do <coughs> is to try to not um, practice medicine, but try to make sure that we raise the standard to which medicine is practiced so that patients are protected. If there is an indication, pharmaceuticals can absolutely go back to the FDA and ex extend what they're allowed to prescribe for, extend the indications. And over time, where before we were at a stage early in our pharmaceutical history where we didn't have so many choices, we have so many choices now. There are so many opportunities for high quality patient care through pharmaceuticals for patients that are on label. And unfortunately, this can lead to harm. This can lead to an epidemic of children being uh, prescribed uh, highly uh, brain active antipsychotic medications, for example. Um, and, and, and that has been harmful to our children as a real example, off-label use. To the extent that we want to curb that use, we will see the implications and we'll right-size the, the policy as needed. Why not use the clinical drug review program or something like it to identify drugs that have that kind of harmful use and apply prior authorization to those drugs but that's not what the budget language does. The budget language pro prohibits Medicaid from paying for any off-label prescription, no matter how beneficial. We, okay, Why we, would you do that? We, and, and again, my other question is, are there people in the administration proposing to subject public employees to that same restriction through their health benefits? I can speak to the former. I can find out about the latter with the public employees' uh, plan. Uh, to the former, we know that as we make policy, policy is not just a one and done situation. When we rolled out our uh, whole move of the prescription drug benefit into managed care, October 2012, we stopped and took a back step and said, with high, uh, antipsychotics, we need to rethink how we do this transition. And in real time, we stopped, we addressed it, and we fixed it before any patients were harmed. <coughs> to the extent that our intent is to protect patients, to stick to the indication, we will continue down this pathway. To the extent that we need any course corrections, we are willing and able to make them in real time. <coughs> okay, thank you. The next questioner is Senator Savino. Thank you, uh, Senator DeFrancisco. Uh, good morning, Dr. Shah. Returning to the uh, subject of medical marijuana, uh, as you know, I'm the <coughs> chief sponsor in the Senate on the Compassionate Care Act, as Assemblyman Gottfried is in the Assembly. Um, a couple of points um, that I would like you to address. Um, I heard in your testimony the issue of establishing a research, a statewide research program, and you address some of the some of that in your response to Assemblyman Gottfried. But I'm curious as to why we think at this point in the history of medical marijuana we need to do a research program of any kind when 21 other states have been doing it. In fact, um, there are other nations. You know, there are other countries besides the United States. There's been extensive research in Israel. There's been extensive research in Canada. Extensive research in Ireland. So we don't really need to research. The, um, the value of medical marijuana as a treatment alternative for people with particular conditions. What we need to do is establish a regulatory model in New York State that will allow for the creation of a legal grow industry so that we have access to a product that is clean, that is uh, multiple, multivaried, um, because as we know, not everybody smokes mar mar excuse me, medical marijuana. In fact, most people don't. Um, so we need to be moving in that direction, not starting as if no one has ever done this before, reinventing the wheel. We are on the verge of being, I think we actually are now, the only state north of Delaware on the East Coast that doesn't have a medical marijuana statute. So if you're interested in research, perhaps you just, you know, pull out the old easy pass and go to Jersey or go to Connecticut or go to Massachusetts or fly to Colorado if you want to do some research. I think the, the department would be, um, their time would be better spent working on a regulatory structure that would implement 
the, uh, the Compassionate Care Act that Assemblyman Gottfried and I have so that, as you pointed out, you want, to be, you want to be in front of it, not behind it. You want to get there faster rather than later. Let's work on that process so when we do get the legislation passed and the governor signs it, you're already way ahead of the game in the implementation process. Thank you, Senator. I mean, my, my goal is yours, the, to improve the health, protect the health and safety of New Yorkers and offer options of proven therapeutic benefit. And because of the existing statute, that is the only mechanism I have today to advance uh, the process. To the extent that safe, clean, unadulterated product is going to be, you know, primary to making this product work, we're looking to the feds for the sources. To the extent that we're using a medical model with the hospitals providing uh, product, that's another way where we can, within the existing therapeutic relationship of the doctor and the patient, advance this model. The science is actually changing. You know, 10 years ago versus today, there are many more drugs out there that help patients. In fact, when we first started down this pathway, we got a lot of feedback from ophthalmologists saying absolutely not don't allow medical marijuana for glaucoma. There are new treatments available that help, so please don't go down that pathway. To the D extent Dr. Shah, with all due respect, most of those drugs that are now available are highly addictive and dangerous. This is not about picking one drug over the other. This is about allowing doctors and patients to make the best decisions for themselves, depending on how they want to treat the condition that they have. I agree. Whether or not ophthalmologists want to utilize medical marijuana as opposed to an alternative drug should be a decision that they make. We don't, need to re we don't need to take tools out of their toolbox, and we don't do that with any other drug. Two minutes ago, you testified about restricting the use of off-label drugs. Well, it, 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 we're, there seems to be an inconsistency here. We don't have a lot of time, and I know a lot of my colleagues want to talk about the health care issues and the hospital closings in Brooklyn. I want to focus on this issue because I think your department is going down the wrong path, and in fact, many respects, you're wasting your time. It is inconceivable that the federal government is going to give New York State a waiver to allow hospitals to dispense medical marijuana. It's it has not been done in any other state. In states that have a legal medical marijuana statute and a program up and running, the federal government has not given them any leeway. I cannot imagine a scenario where they would do that for New York. I am sure you are aware of and have a copy of the August 2013 memo from the Justice Department which dictates the type of things you need to do in a state that has a medical marijuana statute to avoid the federal government coming in and raiding you. Everything that, you are, that, you're, that you've been asked to work on would subject us to a consistent raiding process by the federal government. So what I would again emphasize is take the time that you have Ask your department to begin to develop regulations that will promulgate the Compassionate Care Act. So when we do pass it and the governor signs it, that process will be, will be that much further down the road of getting a legal medical marijuana industry in this state. Because we've seen in other states, the regulatory process has been a stumbling block. There are patients who are suffering right here in New York. There are families with children who cannot wait for us to do this right. You said yourself that there's no way to get this Charlotte's Web strain that will help children with Darvate syndrome. And so those families are moving Except to Colorado. NYU. Yeah. They're going, they're moving, no, because you see, you can't bring a product into New York State. That's also what the Justice Department has said. Even if you bring it from a state that has a legal medical marijuana program. So unless we're growing it here in New York, which we can't, where are we going to get it from? So all I'm suggesting is let's do this the right way. You work on the regulations on our bill, and then we'll get there much faster so that when we can start growing, we're able to provide real relief to patients. We cannot continue to lose people to other states. They're moving to Colorado. They're moving to New Mexico. They're moving to Washington State because they can't wait for New York anymore. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we've been joined by Assemblyman McDonough. <laughs> Next question, Assemblyman Kuzik. And we've been joined by Senator Brad Hoyleman. Sorry. Assemblyman Kuzik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Commissioner. Commissioner, in your uh, testimony, you mentioned iStop. Uh, and I just wanted to say uh, uh, thank you to the Department of Health. Uh, it has been a, a big success uh, since it was implemented in August. Uh, one, one question I have on, on iStop is I know that. <laughs> Senator Lanza and I had sent you a letter earlier uh, last week 
uh, concerning. iStop has been very successful. And, and like anything with success, there come some, some uh, uh, circumstances that we, we, uh, that we see now after the success of, of the database, uh, particularly in, in Staten Island and areas that are surrounded by other states. People are now going to New Jersey, Pennsylvania, surrounding states to get these, these drugs. Um, with the lack of a federal database, uh, is it possible for the state of New York to now look into uh, joining into agreements with New Jersey, Connecticut, and other states? I know that there are similar databases, of course not as good as New York State, uh, but uh, there are similar databases uh, like iStop in the other states. Can we join uh, and share information? Uh, you know, that's a great suggestion. To the extent that I don't think we can share individual level information because of the statute that exists today in terms of privacy and security of the data, but there are many ways that we can coordinate and I will follow up with my colleagues in those states, in our certain neighboring states, to see what more can be done. At the federal level, uh, the health commissioners get together and we talk about problems and this is one that we talk about regularly. And one of the major initiatives of this group this year is around prescription drug abuse. And I have signed a pledge to work on this problem and continue to advance uh, New York's po uh, position in improving uh, treatment options for patients uh, and uh, stopping diversion and abuse as much as we can. Absolutely. No, I, I, I appreciate that because I know the district attorneys are very concerned about this. Uh, law enforcement is very concerned about it. Uh, and uh, it is it is the next the next issue in this ongoing uh, epidemic, uh, and it would be helpful if we could start figuring out what we could do uh, in the state of New York to to help tie that that part of this epidemic. Uh, also, on the issue of iStop, uh, we we know that it has uh, it has worked. Uh, I'm hearing from a lot of doctors uh, in in the state saying that uh, at first they were a little leery about it. Uh, but I think people are starting to realize that it helps them. Uh, will there be a report, a six-month report, or a, some type of report as to exact numbers on, on where we are with this? Maybe we'll try to do a press release today. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Get to work, guys. Great, great. <laughs> also, too, I want to switch gears a little bit uh, with uh, Sandy. Uh, with, the, with Sandy and the aftermath of Sandy, there were quite a few areas, particularly Staten Island, Long Island, uh, that the areas that were hit, that's where the hospitals were, that the hospitals were in flood zones. Uh, and uh, is, has there been a study been made by the state since Sandy on areas that the hospitals are in the actual flood zones? And is there, a, is there an attention put on those hospitals now for added funding to, to secure them or to come up with an alternate plan uh, when, you know, other than just the evacuation of, of the patients. But now we know that some of these hospitals are vulnerable and now is the time to try to figure something out. Is there a, yes. a study in, in place? Yes, there's actually been a lot of work done, first after Irene and Lee and then continuing after Sandy through today uh, in the department and uh, actually with the feds as well looking at revising the flood zones, understanding which institutions are affected, understanding the plans for sheltering in place and making sure everyone understands them, uh, working on plans for generators uh, so they can be you know, plug and play across all the institutions instead of uh, different hookups from one institution to the next, different systems, something called e-fines, uh, bracelets that uh, can be, uh, when a patient needs to be evacuated from a given institution, whether it's a nursing home or a hospital, that bracelet will help you find that patient and track them in real time wherever they should go. Um, this has been an incredible success built over just a few months and already we're looking at other states are very interested in licensing our, our technology, the eFind system. Um, so there is a lot of work. There are after action reports and other stuff that we can share with you and I'll have my department share. There's extensive plans for all the institutions uh, and not only institutions, non-institutionalized vulnerable residents, patients on oxygen, patients uh, who are electricity dependent. For example, insulin needs to be refrigerated. A and what to do, how to identify them in real time, how to care for them in real time, when to move them, or when to shelter in place. All of that has been addressed. 
That's great because I know parochially the, in our, in Staten Island, we have two hospitals that one is in a flood zone and one's not in a flood zone, uh, but both need help with funding to make sure that, God forbid, there's another, there's another flood or another storm that both hospitals are equally protected. Uh, so I think that that should be part of the focus of, of whatever uh, studies that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Senator Rivera. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Commissioner Shaw. I have a few brief questions. <coughs> First of all, on the capital restructuring financing program, I wanted to see if you could briefly, uh, I know that you spoke about it during your uh, testimony, but if you could expand it a little bit both, <coughs> excuse me, on the purpose and more importantly on the criteria that will be used to uh, distribute this money. So the capital restructuring funds that the governor has proposed in his budget are $1.2 billion to be expended over seven years. And we've worked in partnership with uh, various types of institutions who, and societies, Greater New York Hospital Association, Haney's, uh, and uh, other associations to make sure that it meets the needs. The point of this uh, money is, for example, when, I'll give you one real example. If a hospital needs to transition to more outpatient care, um, the rooms that are set up for inpatient units are not appropriate for outpatient or ambulatory care visits. You need to re reconfigure them, put in different pieces of equipment, all of that. To date, we don't have the money for it. Institutions don't have the money for it. <coughs> and unfortunately, the federal government has decided that bricks and mortar or capital changes like that cannot be funded by the waiver. Um, that leaves a big hole in, the opera in our transformation plans for the state of New York. That, that hole is about a billion dollars big, and that's why offering this as part of a complementary system to the waiver funding will mean that as part of the transformation plan, what the waiver can fund, the waiver will fund. When bricks and mortar are involved, this capital fund can fund. So it can be a, a full plan, not just let's work uh, off of uh, half of a plan of reducing readmissions. Let's actually give the money to change a system so a hospital, a clinic, a nursing home can reconfigure to meet p patients' needs in a transformed system. The, the criteria that's set in the, uh, that is set up in the language, uh, I, was, I was just reading the language in the budget, and it's very, it is, I, I guess you're saying that it is flexible on purpose? It's meant to be as complementary as possible to the waiver. To the extent that we want that the, the triple aim, we're looking at the State Health Innovation Plan, which is our roadmap for the next five years of New York, that is the same thing as the waiver, is the same thing as these funds, all of them will be graded on the same metrics. So to the extent that an application is good, it's going to be good on all levels. It's not going to be heading off in one direction with the waiver, another direction with the health innovation plan, and another, a third direction with the capital financing. They're all going to be fully aligned. Mm -hmm. I might have some follow-ups later on that. Uh, moving on to, our last year, we had a very, uh, we had a long conversation both during the hearings and during the whole budget process regarding what, what I've termed the bucket problem. Uh, the, well, I, ca I called it the bucket problem, but this oh, is just yes. the way that I referred to it. This was the, uh, when public health programs were, uh, in the original proposal from the governor, were supposed to be split into seven different pools, et cetera. Uh, so I see that there is a version of it, it seems, in this uh, budget language relates to uh, consolidating 36 public health awareness programs into 10 funding streams. So I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about how that is similar or different from last year's proposal and how exactly will it work, since it seems, uh, at least in the language as is, that there will be no cut to the funding, but uh, I'm still unclear as to the criteria that will be used to determine which programs would be, would be coming back uh, and, uh, and, the, and what funding level they'll be coming back to. So what the senator is referring to is in the public health budget specifically, uh, we've tried to group together common areas, maternal and child health, as one bucket, you know, where multiple buckets used to exist for maternal programs, child health programs, because what we've found is that many of the recipients of the funding were going across multiple buckets. So it's the same group that would get funding from one line item and a second line item. In those kinds of areas, we've consolidated the line items which will make for administrative simplicity to them, 
and to us and can allow them to not silo their program in response to us. So this is actually a win-win. It is unlike last year's buckets completely. It has no cuts in funding. It has uh, no anticipated real changes at all other than administrative simplicity, some savings in terms of our end and on, on the end of the people applying for the funds. It's, it's actually a very good thing. So if I'm not mistaken, last year we were talking about in the neighborhood of 90 programs. And this year we're talking in the neighborhood of 36. So I figure, if, if I'm understanding your explanation correctly, these 36 correspond to particular agencies or entities that have programs that kind of cross over to different categories of? Uh, yes. The different buckets from the, uh, the past, we've consolidated them in ways that make sense for the programs themselves. So if you're a nonprofit and you used to get funding from three different lines and you have to do three different reporting mechanisms, uh, but they're all related to maternal and child health, for example, you can apply once for the sum total of all the money you used to get, consolidate your own programs internally, do one application, still get the same amount of money as you used to under the old system, mm -hmm. but it's better for you, it's better for the department, it's better for, the, for, for everyone. I might have some stuff later, but for now I'm good. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Assemblyman, Assemblyman Lentall. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. First of all, I'm encouraged by recent developments, and I'm, and I'm very uh, happy with the governor and with you for uh, what looks like a plus that we're going to get the Medicaid waiver funding. I think that's, uh, that's definitely important to me, who comes from Brooklyn and I'm sure to other folks in the state. And I certainly applaud the governor for that. Um, and I'm also pleased by the governor's commitment to help Brooklyn hospitals. Uh, however, I do have some questions about the uh, funding, Medicaid waiver funding in particular, as well as uh, health care funding in the budget. Uh, First of all, and, and I, I'm sorry that I missed your presentation, but I tried to catch up by reading some of it, and you probably answered a lot of these questions in your presentation, so forgive me if I go over them again. Uh, one interesting plan that we've looked at at the delegation, both the Senate and the Assembly, is the Dr. Fred Hyde plan, which calls for, uh, that would cost the state about $1 billion to build new ambulatory care facilities in Brooklyn. That's just Brooklyn alone. That's not the whole state. So I'm assuming that the $1.2 billion that's in the budget is not only for Brooklyn. Am I correct in that? You're correct. So, uh, and I don't guess that it's necessary to spend the $1.2 billion in building all of those facilities right away, that some of it could be used uh, in the course of a plan to build those facilities. So I guess uh, since you said that the waiver funding can't be, can't be used for uh, capital projects, are we going to be able to do it? Are we going to have enough? Because we've been out front with our Medicaid redesign team in trying to come up with a different proposal than hospitals. And if we don't do it quickly enough, a lot of the hospitals are going to close. Yeah. So we have on the one hand, we have struggling hospitals that are in dire need of funding, and we have a medical, Medicaid redesign team plan that will build ambulatory care facilities. By the way, I don't like that expression because in the neighborhoods that I come from, people don't understand ambulatory care. I like emergency care. They understand that because they go to emergency rooms now, and they prefer to have something that they can hang their hat on that they understand. And th th that's a big question, but th the more important question is, are we going to get there without allowing a huge hospital that serves indigent people in Bed-Stuy and other neighborhoods like Interfaith to fail before we've had the opportunity to do the right thing? You know, the governor made it clear that we can't do it alone. We need the federal uh, government's help on this, and so we are waiting. We are having conversations every day with the federal government on 
moving this forward within the 30 days that you know the governor has made clear we need to get this done right away. Uh, to the extent that our, uh, we're optimistic, but until I get a signed letter from the federal government, I'm not saying that we have the waiver. Uh, we have had very productive conversations, even as recently as Friday, with uh, folks in the White House. To the extent that we're optimistic, we'll get it within 30 days, we will have the opportunity to transform many of the institutions that are teetering. Uh, you're right, the 1.2 billion isn't enough, but there are other opportunities out there. So for example, one of the things that we've talked about is the New York State Health Innovation Plan. And in my remarks, I mentioned this as well, the SHIP. What that requires is a complete transformation of the healthcare delivery system, including advancing primary care. The payers, the private payers are on board to pony up money to help transform the system. I'm talking about the big payers. So it's not us doing it alone. If we're all rowing in the same direction, if we're all saying this is exactly the picture of health we want for New Yorkers, and to get that picture of health, we need this much primary care, we need this much emergency care, urgent care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then people know what they're rowing toward. And so we've been very lucky to be very consistent on message. Whether you call it primary care, ambulatory care, integrated care, urgent care, emergency care, mm -hmm. ultimately people know what we're trying to get to. It's what patients need, the, you know, so they don't have to wait four hours to see a doctor, so they can stay healthy and not get ill. And I'm, I'm optimistic that between the waiver, between our SHIP plan, between all the other things we're doing with Medicaid redesign, that we will make substantial progress in real time. And we have to make real progress in real time to get these waiver dollars down. They're not just gonna write a $10 billion check and say goodbye. They're going to base it on actual performance in real time on system transformation. So that detailed plan has to be approved, and that's where we are right now, in the very weeds, so we can all see exactly where we're going. Now, another thing uh, is that we in the Brooklyn delegation that I happen to be chair of, it's another hat that I wear, so I have to respond to my colleagues, have not seen the submissions to uh, CMS regarding uh, the Medicaid waiver program and the applications. And I wonder if that would, uh, you would be able to furnish us a copy of the two years of submission so that we could take a look at it. So the, the issue is that we have kept on our website the broad plans. And what's happened over time, now four times in the last 18 months, is that we've kind of had to change course. You know, instead of using this construct to pay for it, we need a disrupt construct. construct. And so that means rewriting the plans we had against the 25% hospital re, uh, uh, admission reduction. So it's essentially the same plans. And we've been very public about things that haven't been funded as a result. From our first plan to now, they're not gonna fund capital. So the governor's taken that on. They're not funding IT. You know, the, the few things that they aren't funding, we've been explicit about. So our goals are the same, the broad concepts are the same, Unfortunately, it is really a work in progress, a day-to-day -day conversation on the details of the metrics. Isn't this a lot like the income tax? We send a lot of money to Washington, <laughs> uh, and that's what we did with our Medicaid redesign program. We yeah. sent a lot of money to Washington, and we're getting back 10 billion after we're saving them 17 or 18 or 20 exactly billion dollars. Right. That's exactly right. We're on track to save them 17 billion, and we're asking for 10 billion back so our, to continue to save them even more. Well, okay, let's move on. If, if, we, if we receive the funding, I'm being optimistic now, and I want to believe that we're gonna receive it, whether it's one billion, two billion, hopefully it'll be 10 billion. But uh, many people say that much of that funding should be directed towards safety net hospitals. So uh, I guess I don't really know, we've heard the term bandied about a lot, I don't know exactly what it means except uh, what hospitals, are we talking about the percentage of people who use a particular hospital who are me on Medicaid? Uh, is that an important determinant? I think it is. And would the income and demographics of the surrounding area also be considered yes. in determining whether it's a safety net hospital? Yeah, the vast majority of the waiver, the 7.9 billion of it, is this district part of it, which is uh, 
built around the construct of helping safety net hospitals. But that's writ broadly. So when you say a hospital, remember most hospitals are also the primary providers of primary care in a given community as well. Mm -hmm. They also have all of the ambulatory clinics and outpatient care. A lot of it is by a hospital. So what we talk about when we talk about hospital now is not what we used to think about, which is just one tower. And so to the extent that this waiver, when it helps our safety net, is not really just helping hospitals, it's helping mental health facilities, it's helping primary care, it's helping nursing homes in many instances. It's yes, helping others I, I get that. who are I part of that. I saw that in your remarks, and I'm glad to see yeah. that. But excuse you, me, you Joe. Envision? Joe, excuse me. I know with I'm, all, I know with all over, due respect, you see that big zeros, all those zeros? See They've been there for a while. I see it, but I'm actually speaking on behalf of all the Brooklyn members. Oh, I'm sure they'll here. not ask any questions. Thank you. <laughs> 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 he said he was speaking on behalf And I only think there's one here. So. No. Hmm. Senator Montgomery. Oh, I can. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, You'll get another chance, Do you envision chance, a Joe. competitive process it, for this funding? Uh, no. I mean, to the extent that it's written within the federal documents, what we, what we will give them, the documents we give them specify this is the outcome we get means these are the dollars we get. So it's not like a, a free-for-all. Uh, let's here's a ten billion dollar check. Use it as you will. Whoever is the uh, the most successful in terms of reducing readmission gets the money. It's not like that. It's pre-specified. My last question is the billion dollars. The last is one that a maximum last or a minimum amount for Brooklyn? The, the billion a, dollars that the governor's talked about to, to to help save Brooklyn hospitals is that a is that a minimum or a maximum? There are multiple sources of money that lead to. Uh, part of the Brooklyn solution. And it's always been about hospital transformation to the extent that there are money from the capital side, from that 1.2 billion. There's money from the waiver that is going to some of the safety net institutions inside. There's other monies as well. All of that combined adds up to a lot. I can't tell you how much it is today until we get our federal waiver and, and, and what that means. Because you know I, I'm hoping for 10 billion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're joined by Senator Montgomery, and, and Joe, thank you for speaking on behalf of every legislator so that we can go on to other <laughs> topics. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but... I'm joined by Assemblyman Crouch. I'm and, sorry, Mr. Chairman, but uh, and the next, in past meetings, I'll yield my time. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll yield my time in future meetings. Okay, great. We'll hold you to that. Uh, and the next uh, questioner is the... Uh, most valuable player of the Super Bowl, Malcolm Smith. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My first question is just uh, one around the uh, health plan marketplace exchange. And, and you're right, you did tremendous work there. Uh, even as Washington was having its problems, uh, New York was speeding ahead, uh, doing a lot of uh, enrollment. Um, but I have just uh, some concerns that I have been getting from, from my constituents, uh, in particular one around Emblem Health. And I know you, you in your testimony, talked about 53% of the individuals have less expensive uh, health care costs. Uh, this particular individual uh, who meets the criteria for what I thought would have been a very uh, low cost health care plan has three children, she has a mortgage, and her health care costs went from uh, $200 to $339, and, and she is suffering. Now, I know she reached out to Donna in your office and Trina in the governor's office, but uh, she's just one of a few. Uh, and so I guess my question is, perhaps you can help me understand how that could happen. Um, and I'm gonna give you all my questions because it, it moves a little faster that way as opposed to back and forth. Second question is on the um, capital program, that $1.2 billion, uh, and it talks more about rehab and, and transformation. Um, and I would hope at some point we start talking about um, construction of new hospitals or clinics or primary care units. Because as you know in Queens, and I, I'm excited about the waiver, uh, I hope that while that saves money on one end, it frees up resources on another. Because you know we have lost St. John's Hospital, we lost Peninsula Hospital, uh, we lost Mary Immaculate Hospital. We now only have um, Jamaica Hospital, which is serving people out of trailers, and St. John's Episcopal in Rockaway is almost on the verge of, of falling uh, prey to closing as well. 
Um, so from a healthcare standpoint, we don't have anything. So um, we need help. And I'm saying that appealing to all my colleagues who are here, as well as those in the audience, uh, to take up Southeast Queens as a mission. Because in an area that has grown in population almost to a, close to a million people, um, we have uh, only one healthcare clinic on the uh, east end or the west end, and one on the, the uh, southern end, and both of which are, are well uh, uh, are doing very poorly, I should say, in terms of healthcare. So uh, perhaps you can help me with some of that. Sure. So let me get to your first question first. Uh, you know, the, the individual who's seen uh, the amount of money she spends on a monthly basis for her health care insurance go up. Um, Obviously, Donna Frescatore is aware and, and will work with that individual uh, on her particular circumstances. But in general, what's happened is people thought they had insurance, and they didn't. They didn't actually have good coverage. You know, there was uh, entire industries out there who charged seventy dollars a month for health insurance for their folks, and that seventy dollars a month led to a total cost of maybe two thousand of insurance, after which the person's on the hook. It wasn't really insurance; it was a sham. And to the extent that what we have now is high quality health insurance that meets very specific standards set by the feds in terms of preventive care, covering the right kinds of things to keep you healthy in the first place, it might have gone up. But she might be getting something very different than what she thought she had. But, but what, if she do, what does she do if she cannot afford that? I mean, $339 with three children and a mortgage. And she works for a, a local insurance. Uh, agency, not, not a health insurance agency, one that provides car and auto and all that stuff. Um, you know, there are going to be, uh, I, I'd love to dive deeply into a given circumstance. I can tell you that the vast majority of people, for the very first time, have insurance. I mean, this is, we're getting $5 billion a year in subsidies from the feds in terms of tax credits and other credits to help insurance, uh, to help New Yorkers buy insurance. It's a very big deal. Um, so yes, there may be individual circumstances, and we let, try to minimize those, and we try to see what other services they may be eligible for that can help them. Um, but for the vast majority of New Yorkers, for the 350,000 who've already gotten an insurance card to date on the exchange, this is a very good thing. And it's good for the hospitals, who are now getting less uncompensated care. It's good for providers. It's good for, it's good for all of us. So, and, Southeast and, Queens, because that's, so let that's, me get the, to the, that's the 800 pounds. So, to the extent that you know, Southeast Queens is uh, obviously has its unique set of circumstances that are also very urgent. The North Country has its own unique set of circumstances that are very urgent. We are looking, and the governor's budget uh, suggests that regional planning is a way where each region decides what it needs okay. based on local data, based on local culture, based on local conditions. Mm -hmm and says this is how we need to re-envision health care in our system. This is what we have to work with. This is where we need to go. State, this is how we want it. And, and that's where we're counting on. And there's money to fund regional planning. Yeah, and, and, I, and I can appreciate the analysis, the important of it, importance of it. But you know, there's an old you know, paralysis of analysis. I mean, you just keep <laughs> analyzing. Right now, you know, there are people in Southeast Queens that are sick. They get hurt. They have no place to go. They go to to emergency rooms and they're there for three and four hours. So a study that may go on for another year or so, and I appreciate you know, the regional planning. I think that concept works. But what do we do now for relief? Yeah, this, this is not a study. This is not a, a year. This is a, for example, in the North Country, they just started about a month ago, and they're going to report out their final recommendations by March. Okay. And that, it, it, it's not been in isolation. Things have been happening in the North Country. So to the extent that we're looking to jumpstart the process, build off of stuff that's already happened in each region, and, and accelerate very quickly, um, this is uh, something that I think can provide real relief. And over the long term, provide a structure for continued improvement and continuous improvement of every part of the state in every region. Well, I do hope you make sure that uh, my office, as well as my colleagues in Southeast Queens, uh, made a, kept abreast of it, <laughs> as well as being involved. Thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Chairman. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have been joined by Assemblyman Abinati, and uh, we now will hear from Mr. Rhea. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I just have uh, two, two policy areas that I want to follow up with. Uh, my office has been getting bombarded uh, by pharmacists, and it's not often that the independent pharmacists and the chain pharmacies see eye to eye on, a, on an issue. So I guess this one is pretty important to them. And it deals with the, uh, the, the new proposal, the average acquisition cost pharmacy reimbursement. That's in the budget. Uh, I guess my first question is, uh, why is the health department pursuing, uh, pursuing such a significant change since we, I guess, changed things around back in 2012, moving, uh, I guess, about three quarters of the, the folks uh, out of fee-for-service uh, and Medicaid to manage care? Uh, how much money did we, did we save back in 2012 to now, and why the need for the big shift again? So this relates to a proposal on how much do we reimburse based on drugs, right? There's different ways that people say, I'm gonna charge you 50 bucks a pill, I'm gonna charge you 500 bucks a pill. And wh where do they base that off of? What numbers do they base that off of? Well, the reality is there've been a lot of different methodologies on how to pay for that pill. The reality is also that we know what everyone's paying on average. And shouldn't New York State taxpayers get that same deal? Shouldn't we also pay what the average person is paying? So the average acquisition cost says this is what actually, some people are paying $5 a pill, some people are paying 500. What is the average out there? We should pay the average. We shouldn't be ripped off. We shouldn't rip off taxpayers. Let's pay the average. So we're not paying the lowest. We're not paying the highest. Let's pay the average. It's a standard methodology. Many other, most other states actually use the average acquisition costs. You know, we've been, uh, a little behind in that sense, and uh, unfortunately, there will be some real cuts, but there will be some also gains, because it hasn't been a rational methodology up, to, up till now. The average acquisition cost is fair for New York taxpayers to pay the average price for a drug that everyone else is paying, whether you're a private insurer or someone else. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, it's my understanding that the different pharmacy associations have requested a meeting uh, with your office, and, and I'm hoping that that's going to take place. Uh, so maybe they, you can hold their hand Absolutely. a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you. My next uh, area is dealing with assisted living. Obviously, as uh, New York continues to age uh, in its population, uh, we're seeing a greater need for uh, assisted living facilities. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can tell me, uh, since the Assisted Living Reform Act was passed in 2004, how many uh, ALRs uh, applications have been processed? I couldn't tell you since 2004, but I'm sure my folks can, and we can get that number back to you. Well, I guess one of my, qu my concerns is uh, I believe there's been about 375 applications filed since 2005, but there's still 200 applications that remain pending. Uh, one of the concerns is, I guess, there's only four project managers that have literally 100 applications sitting on their desk. Uh, is there anything in this upcoming budget that's going to help relieve that burden uh, for those case managers? Because you know, my concern is we're, we're trying to welcome in uh, yeah. new businesses, and, and uh, certainly assisted living would uh, generate revenue for local economies. Yeah, absolutely. And with the whole, uh, we're reviewing the whole system in terms of looking at um, what kinds of services people need. We're taking apart our whole certificate of need process and saying, you know, we need to understand where urgent centers, emergency rooms, primary care, what is the continuum of care? How do we fill it out? And how do we make it less burdensome and more responsive? So that as part of that process, we will certainly look at this right. as well. Oh, because I understand you streamline the application process, which, which is good because uh, that was a nightmare in itself. Uh, but uh, you could streamline it all you want, but if you don't have the, the bodies there to, to review the applications, uh, it becomes problematic. And, and, yeah, and at the end of the day, it's about the right things for patients and about dollars. You know, if they're stuck in a nursing home because they don't have a, another place to go, it'll cost us more money. So we are very aggressively looking to get people what they need. Well, thank you, Commissioner. Senator Katchik. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Commissioner Shaw. I wanted to talk about uh, early intervention services. As you know, the state provides early intervention service, services through uh, a provider network, and we're, through this service, reaching very young children with disabilities and providing them services to help them get ready for schools, to help them get ready for 
life. And uh, these are children who are significantly disabled and need help from birth to age three. Uh, la and last year we made a change to this uh, service and, it, and there were some problems uh, with regard to it. And the problem was that uh, the change we made in last year's budget was essentially resulted in providers not getting paid timely and providers being expected and uh, to go after third party payers and insurance companies and they would not get paid until they received those, those funds. <coughs> Um, and the, the problem with the providers, when it came to my attention, uh, it seemed to be clear that there needed to be a legislative fix. And I introduced legislation last October, and I'm very thankful that the chairs of the <coughs> four committees in the assembly came together and had a hearing all day regarding this. And I'm very thankful that the health committee chairs are moving legislation in both houses, and hopefully we can come up with that legislative fix. So my, my question to you is, does the proposed executive budget contain sufficient funds to make prompt payment to providers for the services they provided in, they will be providing this year, 2014-15, and is there sufficient reappropriation money in the budget to make the still unpaid providers uh, from last year whole? Thank you for your questions. You know, this was a real issue uh, over the summer for many providers, and we heard from them firsthand, and in real time, as much as we could, we tried to extend lifelines to certain providers who were uh, feeling the, the heat even more than others. Uh, and I'm proud to say that as of last week, um, we are now at 91% payment in terms of where we have been historically before this whole uh, transition occurred. We're at those rates of payment. Uh, so we've uh, we, we've reached 91 is not 100 and we will do better but we have made up our uh, losses for the last year and we're where we need to be for today and we have more to do um, there is sufficient funding in the budget and one of the things that people don't know is there's actually substantial relief for counties in the budget by what we've done uh, up about 15 percent of payments from 2012 and earlier, actually, that hadn't been processed by the counties, we're taking over the processing and we're advancing them very quickly. So there is actual substantial relief at many levels to the counties, to the providers, to end up with a, a really good system uh, that once and for all will meet uh, the needs of the providers and the, uh, the patients they serve. I can tell you that we've been tracking uh, impacts on uh, patients, on EI uh, recipients, and to date, we haven't seen negative impacts, and we will continue to monitor that very closely and report on, uh, out on it quarterly. Well, I, I appreciate your comments, but there, there, to me, there have been negative impacts when I know there are children in my district that are not getting services because the providers aren't getting paid and they have to stop those services and get another job because they have to pay their bills too. So there, there was a loss of service to children at a very vulnerable age, as you know. When we help children at this age is the best time to help them. And the fact that we changed a system and we didn't make it better, we caused problems. I think we have to be very careful when we're changing systems that we get it right. So I'm understanding you're, what, you, what you're saying is there is enough money in this proposed budget to cover all of those payments owed to providers that have not been paid yet from last year and enough money in the budget to cover all of the providers uh, that we expect to be needing uh, to be out in the field in this year's budget. You're telling me that the budget is sufficient to cover both? Yes. Okay, thank you. Next, Assemblyman Goodell. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you very much for your comments and testimony. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how uh, you envision the implementation of the state delivery system reform incentive payment with the initiative of reducing inpatient hospitalization by 25 percent. And my concern is that uh, not just Brooklyn is facing struggling times. A lot of our rural hospitals are yes. as well. And uh, Mr. Lentil will appreciate I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Assembly Chautauqua County delegation. 
as the only assemblyman. <laughs> but um, uh, one of the challenges that I see, and I was hoping you could address, if we're reducing uh, inpatient utilization, and I think that's a good idea, and working to expand outpatient services, at the same time the certificate of need process has been extraordinarily cumbersome and expensive, particularly for our hospitals, and my hospitals are reporting that the credentialing process, even for a, an experienced board certified <coughs> physician, can take upwards of a year. And so if we want to move toward outpatient services, what are we doing in this budget or in your sure. overall to reduce the certificate of need time frame and <clears throat> accelerate the credentialing process so that we can actually accomplish that? So thank you for your questions. Uh, these are very important. You know, how do we get to 25% reduction in inpatient hospital, uh, unnecessary inpatient hospital use? There are many hospitals across the state that have upwards of 40, 50% inappropriate admissions. That means the patient doesn't need to be admitted to the hospital, and yet they do get there. Why? Any number of reasons. Maybe there's no other place for them to go. You know, maybe there's um, other financial issues involved. To the extent that um, this is a big deal, reducing by 25% over five years is a very big deal. It will require an all-hands-on-deck approach. And that's what this DSRIP, D-S-R-I-P, this waiver, this 7.9, you know, this federal <coughs> waiver is all about that because we know to achieve that vision, we need to get mental health and physical health integrated. We need to build out patient care. We need to make sure that our certificate of need actually is less uh, invasive or um, <coughs> less burdensome on primary care. And, and to, the, to that extent, all of our proposals to date have actually looked to reduce the burden for outpatient care, not set new burdens. Uh, certainly, it's been a work in progress on the inpatient side, reducing the burdens of the certificate of need. And we've made real progress. And in, uh, both the hospital associations will testify later today. You can ask them directly, have we seen actually a net reduction or a net gain? It, we're going in the right direction. A lot more needs to be done. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that with the DISHRIP uh, waiver funds that we will continue to see the gains we need. Because we're all pointing toward the inpatient hospitalization reduction, we know what other parts of the system we need to build up, that we don't put burdens on those parts as we build them up, and we come to an actual unified system. This is uh, an incredible plan. This is a shooting for the stars. But even if we don't sh sh uh, hit the stars, we hit the moon, we'll have uh, achieved something incredible. Uh, thank you. Could you also address why is it that uh, the credentialing takes sure. upwards of a year for So the credentialing like a is something that I position. have a personal interest in, uh, as well as a doctor, and having gone through credentialing uh, several times in New York State and seeing uh, why do I need my diploma translated from Latin every time and then. <laughs> Uh, the, the burden is incredible, and I have convened a working group of the hospital associations saying, you need to come up with a common standard. When Hurricane Sandy hits and a hospital shuts down and other hospitals are overburdened, you need to have a system so that those docs can start working in the other hospital tomorrow, not a year from now or a week from now even. And so we've been convening this working group. The state has been convening the hospital associations saying, let's agree to common standards for credentialing. Everyone has their own unique flavor. Everyone has their own paper forms. And it is incredibly expensive, painful for physicians. It's a barrier for us to practice in the state. And we need to get to one system. So we've been working on it. We've made some real progress. And I'm hoping that over the next three to six months, I don't think we'll get to one form for the whole state of New York. But I think we'll get to one form for 95 to 99% of what a hospital needs for credentialing. And then they'll have their one pager where they have some other questions for a doc to be uh, receiving credentials. And that would be a state partnership with the private side so that everyone's lives are easier. And uh, could you address as well the issue of getting uh, board certified physicians who are authorized to practice in other states, authorized in New York State as well, which is a corollary, of course, to the credentialing process. But it's my understanding right now that a experienced physician uh, from another state can typically get licensure authorization in our neighboring states in a matter of weeks, but takes months in New York. 
what's being done on that issue because it's particularly challenging when you're trying to recruit new physicians to come to New York State. So this is one of the issues that I have is why does the state education department have some roles in things while I have other roles? And I would love for you guys to consider what roles should come over to the Department of Health along those lines. Well, I was- I'm uh, asking for more work. <laughs> as you can appreciate, uh, Commissioner, um, the head of the education operation may have a different perspective, and so I was interested in yours. You know, there, there's reasons why they have it. They're doing it for all the professions. They're doing it in a unified manner. But there are nuances to the workforce issues that we face, the critical shortages we face in primary care, um, and filling out the rest of the workforce uh, that make um, faster, more agile, responsive licensing uh, one of the opportunities that we can work on together. Uh, I had one other question on a slightly different issue, and that is, uh, as you've mentioned, we've had the rollout of the uh, health exchange. We have multiple levels, anywhere from bronze to platinum. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our other challenges, of course, is moving people from public assistance or encourage them to become privately uh, employed gainfully. <coughs> How's the Medicaid system coverage right now compare to bronze, silver, gold, platinum, or is it above platinum? And if so, how do we address that transition? That's a great question. And I, I, I don't think it's actually an apples to apples comparison, because I, I can't say that it is platinum. I know that the Medicaid coverage cover, uh, is uh, generous in, in the right ways. And uh, what we're trying to work on is to make it as seamless as possible so that when uh, a recipient moves from Medicaid to a private plan on the marketplace, ideally, or back, um, what we're ultimately trying to do is to get womb to tomb coverage, right? Medicaid already through Child Health Plus, we're already covering kids. What happens when they grow up? What kinds of insurance products do they go through? Most times when you get to graduate school, you're again uninsured because you're over 26 and you don't have the money to, to pay for something. Well, how do we make that continuum a real continuum? so that folks can then get a product on the exchange that looks like some of the products they had before, and then ultimately in the commercial space as they grow and have jobs that provide health insurance. That's the, the meta vision, is to try to get that unified coverage with a high quality plan with baseline standards. And we're already seeing that people are starting to understand health insurance, and that actually young invincibles did sign up for health insurance on our uh, exchange. And small businesses, while at a slow start, are starting to jump on board. So it's been a, a wait and see kind of approach until now, but after a year or two when people see this is working, it's here to stay, and it's actually high quality insurance at lower cost, you know what, I'm gonna make myself, uh, I'm gonna avail myself to this. It, it is working out. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Senator uh, Golden, and before we go, go to the, the next questioner, can you make your answers a little more concise Yes. And to the point of the question, uh, because otherwise we will be here till midnight with you alone. We, that, we, we have been joined by Assemblyman Crouch and Assemblyman Walter. Thanks, Senator. And the next questioner is uh, Senator Hoyleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaw, for being here. I'm impressed that you're sitting alone. Um, and uh, you've got a lot on your plate. I wanted to compliment you first for your foresight, your diligence. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I admire you for a lot of the initiatives you've undertaken. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, though, uh, about the status of your report on hydraulic fracturing. And in particular, if you could give us an update, um, who you're consulting with, uh, whether you're gonna be having any public hearings. And I'm particularly interested in chemicals that have been found uh, as a result of contamination. Uh, there was a Los Angeles Times article recently, you probably are familiar with, uh, that a study from the University of Missouri showed that some of the chemicals can actually disrupt hormones and have led to fears of birth defects, infertility, cancer, near sites that have been sampled. Um, and this is in Colorado. Um, and that's in addition to the 350 instances of groundwater contamination in Colorado 
uh, for more than 2,000 uh, gas spills. Um, are you familiar with that study? Um, can you give us a status on your health report? And will you be uh, taking public testimony uh, through that process? So I was charged with a very specific set of um, requests from Commissioner Martens of DEC. And as part of that, what I am conducting is a health review. I'm reviewing the existing literature out there uh, from all available sources to look at what are the potential health impacts. Does our regulatory framework mitigate those risks? Uh, and if not, what else could be done to do that? When we started, we were optimistic. We thought that we could be finished with this review very quickly. As we've uh, taken time to understand what's going on, there is a lot more out there. And I'm in no hurry to play with any potential risks with the health and safety of New Yorkers. So I am not in a hurry to finish my report until I am at a tipping point of the data. What does that mean? We know that there are ongoing studies. The studies you cited, for example, go back to 1996 in terms of the kinds of patients they enrolled and the kinds of uh, birth defects that were looked at and other things. What happened in 1996 is very different than what's going on today. So to the extent that I'm looking at the relevance of research, how it pertains to what New York is proposing under the SGEIS framework, you know, what is the, uh, the evolving nature of the, uh, of the technology, all of that has to play a role. And that's why it's taken much more time and much more energy, and, and it's been a much deeper research review than I originally anticipated. So I'm not in, in a hurry to finish this research review. To the extent that I will uh, fulfill my charge and report back to the commissioner, uh, to Commissioner Martens, the, the review when I'm ready, that is the extent of my plans. So are, are you consulting with uh, experts in a, in a public forum, is, or is this uh, mostly uh, a private study? Well, th this is a highly emotionally charged area. And to the extent that we want to be objective and scientific and stick to the facts, we are continuing our work as needed, reaching out to whoever, uh, whoever I need to reach out to. I've in the past uh, flown around to other experts around the country. We've engaged folks in, in the past uh, individually. Um, and we will do whatever we need to do to make sure that the review is thorough and complete when it is de delivered. Thank you. And since I have a couple minutes left, I'm going to ask you about um, your admirable comments on um, ending the AIDS epidemic in New York, and uh, thank you for those. Um, could you give uh, us an update on the um, department's efforts to achieve bulk pricing for HIV antiretrovirals, something that was pioneered by the Clinton Glo Global Initiative, and I'm very happy to hear that the department is also pursuing that as well, which would, as I understand it, lower significantly uh, the financial burden for people with HIV AIDS and yeah. save the state money at the yeah. same time. So, so this is actually probably one of the uh, most important initiatives from a public health standpoint of the decade, if not longer, to end the AIDS epidemic in New York State, which is the epicenter of AIDS, which we have more cases than everywhere else uh, any other state in the country, uh, to, to be able to do that successfully and commit to it is a very big deal. Part of it is getting patients on therapy and keeping them on therapy. One of the barriers has been the cost of the pharmaceuticals. So we are in ongoing negotiations as we speak with major pharmaceutical providers of antiretrovirals to make sure that as we ramp up um, patients who are getting treatment and staying on treatment, that patients can actually afford it, and we can, we can as a state, afford it. Uh, we don't want another billion dollars going out uh, to uh, line the pockets of others. On the other hand, there are opportunities where we can work together and really set the national model and the international model so that drug companies would be very happy to partner with us and show that this is within reach if you do it right. Let's get more patients on antiretrovirals. Let's keep them on them, and let's make this just uh, uh, you know the prevalence for the very first time to go down of HIV and AIDS. This has been a very big uh, part of our uh, work in Medicaid as well for the last few weeks. Well, please let us know how we can be helpful in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, um, Assemblyman Cahill, and we've been joined by Assemblyman Jeff Aubrey. 
Well, Commissioner, um, I don't expect, nor do I deserve the deference that my colleague from Brooklyn got in the length of time he took the questions. So I'm going to try to do lightning round here. Uh, I have actually six different areas I'd like to cover. I doubt very much we'll cover more than one or two of them. But let's start with uh, early intervention program. Uh, uh, my experience has been that uh, with a approximately 10 hour hearing that we held that we could barely scratch the surface of the issue in 10 hours. I don't expect the seven minutes here to be able to go any further. Um, but I do have some questions about the implementation. Um, you indicated in response to a question from someone else that you're at 91% payment. Can you just tell me how long it takes from service to payment to get to that 91%? As of Jan a week ago, we're there. So to the extent that it was a moving target, there were, there are, and they today are folks who have not been reimbursed for services that were initially uh, delivered in 2012. That exists. Okay. So I don't have an average because it's been a moving average. I can just tell you that we're moving in the right direction. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to doubt very much that the rate of payment is anything remotely close to what it was under the old system, since most providers were being paid within two or three weeks of the provision of their service. And now it's unlikely that a provider is receiving any payment in anything under 30 days, and some of them are waiting 60, 90, and as you pointed out, uh, maybe two years. Um, the, uh, quite honestly, there was one really easy takeaway from our hearing, and that's that the rollout is failing. And I would also respectfully disagree with your assessment that uh, services have not been diminished. You may have statistics that demonstrate that a provider, uh, that the number of providers signing on and the number of providers signing off are relatively constant, but please dig down into those statistics and you will find that the ones who are signing off are group providers and they cover 5, 10, 15, 20, and ARC went out of business. Uh, and the ones who are signing on are individual providers. So the amount of coverage that's out there the network, as it were, for EI providers is diminishing rapidly, mm -hmm. and it is becoming very difficult for many of the remaining providers to stay on board. Um, you have a fiscal agent that you've contracted with to the tune of about $45 million over the life of the contract, plus bonuses. Has the department done any auditing of that fiscal agent to determine whether you're getting value for your dollar in the terms of the service? I'm not sure that we've had time to do the full audit that we would expect to do uh, of that fiscal agent. I know that we are keeping very close tabs on a monthly basis and, and more frequently, and we are reporting out on a quarterly basis. So to the extent that the last quarter may not reflect these last payments uh, that occurred in the last week, the next quarter should reflect that, and we should have updated statistics. Uh, obviously, we, we need to do more. You're right. The I, I would strongly suggest you do more. Uh, several colleagues and I took the time to visit while we were in Nashville. We visited the headquarters of PCG, the much uh, uh, ballyhooed call center. And let me describe it to you in just very minor detail. Uh, the signs on the door, we went to the original offices that are listed on the registry of the building. They were four floors away from where the so-called call center was. The signs on the doors of every office were printed on a computer. They were paper signs. Uh, coincidentally, none of the call center representatives had <coughs> any pictures of their family on their desks or any personal memorabilia in the office. The only thing on the wall were standard posters promoting Nashville as a tourism destination. Uh, the call center existed on a floor where there were, uh, oh, by the way, they weren't using desks, they were using portable folding tables, and they were, if I'm, my recollection serves me correctly, operating on laptops, uh, not desktop systems. Uh, there were, we were told in advance that there were six people uh, employed in the call center. Coincidentally, when we got there, all six were on the phone and unable to talk to us, but they were all there. They also introduced us to two supervisors. Uh, so, uh, you know, I walked away with my colleagues, uh, Senator Seward, Kathy. Uh, Assemblyman Barkley, Senator Breslin, mm -hmm. and we walked away, and I'm not going to speak for them, but we wondered if we didn't just kind of walk into something that maybe Paul Newman and Robert Redford might have done in a movie in the <laughs> 70s with a little boiler room operation that was set up just for us. It really did give us that impression. Um, and, the, and the result 
uh, is bearing that out. Our providers are, have now become bill collectors. Our providers have now had to sort of double the number of hours that they're putting in just to get the payment that they used to get pretty automatically. And we're not seeing a whole lot of relief. I would strongly urge that you uh, take some serious steps and, and review that, but, but with the goal of making sure that, that our providers are able to get paid for the services that they're providing and that we don't make them into bill collectors. Yeah. They're providing a very valuable service. So uh, if you could follow up on that, I would be very appreciative. Um, the next area that I wanted to cover was the Spinal Cord Research Fund. Uh, that was created back in 2000, well actually it was created back in uh, 1998, was defunded uh, when the budget uh, hit the skids in the, in the Great Recession. And this year, the governor is proposing $2 million uh, to, to uh, be part of the fund. The fund was supposed to be $8.5 million. It comes out of the $160 million in surcharges on motor vehicle fees uh, paid for fines. Um, is there any possibility that we could see that fund increased? And uh, if so, if not, then, then how do we expect to keep pace even with uh, what the least of the other states are doing in this area? Thank you for your question. So yes, we are committed to the SCURB, the Spinal Cord, uh, Cord Research Funding, and I understand that one of the things that we are also doing is rolling over unspent funds from last year into this year's uh, budget as well. So we are actively working to manage and expand the, the funding to the extent possible. If there are unspent funds, it's surprising to me because I can identify just three of the several dozen agencies that could use far in excess of the 8.5 that should have been budgeted but has not been budgeted over the past several years. Uh, you know, when it was created and when it was advocated for by people like Christopher Reeve and Sergeant Richter from the, from the New York State Police, um, many of the things that were being proposed were science fiction. They were hopes, they were dreams, they were people who were desperate and hoped that they could get the services that would someday allow them to walk again, allow them to deal with neurological disorders that, that, were, that, were, that were impossible to deal with. Those things are actually happening right now. We could spend 10 or 15 million dollars just advancing the one clinical uh, trial that's being carried out by NYU and Albany Medical Center. We could spend another six million dollars to do some of the stem cell research that's being done in Rochester, and that's just two of the, of the providers. I, I think it's, it's an area ripe for review. Uh, if New York is gonna keep up, if we're gonna do uh, that which we can do, uh, we ought to take a look at this fund and maybe look at uh, beefing it up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, first of all, I'd like to deliver a sincere and heartfelt thank you on behalf of the constituents in my district for your help as far <coughs> as uh, having a response to Lakeshore Hospital and the crisis that is there. And uh, you and the governor and your staff deserve accolades for all that you've done. And uh, so we're hoping uh, that we can come to a positive solution as we work through this process. Um, and, uh, but it kind of leads into a much broader topic area, and that is rural hospitals. I believe that rural hospitals are in crisis right now. As you know, um, rural hospitals have a heavy Medicaid population in most cases to begin with. And as you also know, the Medicaid reimbursements are on the low side. And as a result, rural hospitals need that patient mix of private insurance and, you know, with Medicaid in order to be sustainable. Um, we have had issues in my district and I believe in other parts of the state where you have for-profit entities, outside entities coming in and establishing services that compete with the rural hospitals. <coughs> and for example, they can cherry pick some of the more lucrative patients and they're draining volume patients out of the hospitals and leaving them with very low reimbursements. And that is added to the crisis so that it's unsustainable. But as you also know, for example, in, this, in the situation with Lakeshore, we need to have that hospital operating because for emergency room services, for example, for some people it would actually triple their 
time to get to the emergency room. And that's in good weather, so that you would have people maybe an hour or more, maybe two hours, to be able to get emergency services, and that's not acceptable. But I guess my question is, how can we address this issue where you have these for-profit or other entities coming in and deliberately draining our hospitals and putting them to the point where they have no other option but to go out of business? I think you're, you're absolutely right that the crisis of rural hospitals uh, across New York State is very real. And we need to do whatever we can to think creatively about keeping access to needed services local to patients who may be in otherwise rural or distant places. And so we're doing our best to try to think outside the box. Maybe there are things such as freestanding emergency rooms or other levels of emergency rooms that can help keep needed services in a given community when um, there is no sustainable way for the old model of a hospital. So there's different things we can create, and that's part of the solution to what you suggest. And while private entities are part of the problem, private entities can also be part of the solution. They are relatively well-funded. They have money for capital. They come in with uh, bricks and mortar to build minute clinics or other kinds of um, care that's provided. That care can destabilize the rest of the system or it can be complementary to the rest of the healthcare system. Our goal is to try to make sure that those services are complementary. It's, it's, it's hard. It's not been easy. There's lots of need and there isn't enough care. So how do you advance the opportunities for other providers to come in while at the same time protecting the mission of the nonprofits. Uh, th there, isn't, there hasn't been one answer. It's different in the western part of the state, northern part of the state, southern part of the state. Um, I appreciate your response, Commissioner. Um, I guess what concerns me is that there seems to be an uneven playing field. So that Assemblyman Goodell spoke about the CON process that really slows down, down, down things for the hospitals, but I'm not sure what the review process is from the department as far as these for-profit entities. And as you pointed out so well, you need to have a collaborative um, effort so that they're complementary and not putting one or the other out of business. So I guess, how do you, how do you address that with some of the for-profits? I, I agree that some of them could be part of the solution but it just seems like it's unequal right now because of the review process that exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you, you may be right. I think that we are working very hard to make sure that the process is as least burdensome as possible to everyone. That's our primary goal, is to lower the bar in terms of keeping the protections in place, but the tools we have to make sure that the quality is provided are very different than the tools we had 30 years ago when this process was first developed. So the certificate of need process is the, base, uh, the basic set of tools we have to regulate what comes in and what stays out. And that's why we're looking at that very actively under the leadership of some very smart folks from around the state to look at the rules of CON, but then look at also how else can we get other folks inside. Private, you know, the, the private marketplace is a double-edged sword. And, and to figure out how to manage and get what they can bring in, in terms of accountability and financing and, and agility in terms of knowing how the standards change, they, they provide high quality of care. We've done it very successfully. Look at kidney dialysis. Look at nursing homes where they're, uh, you know, the, much of the market is, is private as well. We have not done it at all in hospitals. So we're trying to be creative as possible in terms of allowing the system to not collapse in and of itself, to bring in private money while at the same time protecting the public mission and public safety. So this is a work in progress. We've had a few conversations, and I appreciate that. Um, you've been keeping us very uh, up to date on the situation because it is changing every time uh, I look at Lakeshore. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, I would, wanted to follow up with some questions about the capital restructuring program. And the governor's proposed $1.2 billion over seven years. I believe it's $200 million a year for five years and then 100 million a year for two years after that. One of the questions I have has to do with the balance between allocation of funds with rural and suburban maybe on one side and urban on the other. We want to make sure
people's mm -hmm. needs are met across the state, but how will the department ensure that that balance exists? If you look at our history with the HEAL program, I think that's a pretty good roadmap. We were pretty balanced. Lots more money than just the 1.2 billion. And we did a, a, a decent job making sure that the needs were met across the state equitably in real time with the best projects being funded. Um, and this was, this was a, you know, our track record of success. We have a track record of success with the HEAL program in this regard, with the M Medicaid redesign team, with our exchange. We have a track record of success on major initiatives. And so with the district and with the waiver, I'm hopeful that that plus the capital money with the plan, the New York State Health Innovation Plan will be the roadmap for the transformation of the system and we will continue our track record of success in this regard as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Excuse me, before you start another question, you're gonna to have to go to the next round. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Commissioner, and um, you've been very good about having conversations, not during hearings, so I look forward to continuing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been joined by Assemblywoman Rosenthal. I'm next to testify to question Assemblywoman Jackie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, I wanted to just follow up on the early intervention issue. Um, you know, as a former special education teacher, and I know you are very aware of how essential early intervention services are for our youth and their future. Uh, but many of our providers have, as you have heard from my colleagues, have really struggled in this last year since the new system has been put into place with the uh, fiscal administrator. Um, they are, they're small, they're providers, they don't have the staff to be able to really follow up and um, over and over again to be able to seek um, the financial uh, assistance and the financial uh, uh, issues really have become huge and, and they, they have been closing and we are losing excellence in our community in terms of, of providers. I was wondering given, I'm, I'm pleased that, that we've now responded to 91% have, have been provided the funding, but considering what has happened, you considering modifying uh, the system, the fiscal system, um, and pay the providers in the, f in the first instance, you know, really change that system and go back to a, a better approach so that they can be um, provided that financial response more immediately so that they can continue the services, <coughs> because we are losing too many of our providers. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right, and we have a strong history that we can be very proud of with early intervention in the state of New York to the extent that when this infrastructure is built, you can't unbuild it and then rebuild it overnight. We need to make sure that we do everything in our power to keep those high quality providers in place and stable. It's been a long road over the past year. I've spoken with staff numerous times, uh, sometimes it seems almost every day about specific issues, whether it's a eight minute response time for the 6,000 calls or, or, you know, details like that should not be uh, something that I should be aware of, but I do know uh, because it is something of primary importance. The success of EI is uh, a success of the department. The failure of EI is a failure of the department. What we've done over the last literally few weeks has radically transformed the state of affairs relative to the prior months, and, and it, part of it has been outside of our control, as you understand to the extent that we've worked with the fiscal agent and with the insurance plans very closely to get the systems up and running, to throw out lifelines when we can. We will continue to do that whatever we, uh, whenever we see something like that happen. I am confident, however, that where we are today with EI is very different than perhaps even a month ago. And perhaps what we can do is have another report out to you where we can detail the differences from a month ago to where we are today. It's literally weak old information I'm talking about. And rather than changing ships mid-course again, let's stick to the system because I think we're there. We're almost there. And give it another, well, let, let's, let's report back to you and see what, what happens. I, I would hope that that just, when you look at, at, at and review what has been happening, the small, the small scale providers, uh, the ones that are really struggling, yeah, um, sure. 
in a very significant way. So I hope that you would take a look at that sure. as well and perhaps consider uh, significant changes uh, that you could offer um, so that they can sustain the services that they provide. Thank you. I also wanted to follow up on a question regarding the uh, hydraulic fracturing. Um, you indicated that you were reviewing the science. Um, and, and, you know, obviously looking at a thorough review, but is there a thorough review uh, that would be more focused on a public um, access, a, a public voice, a public process that has more transparency in, in terms of the public providing their responses, experts in the field, um, scientists, physicians, those who uh, could provide the health input that, from the experts in a, in a very public forum um, that would, um, you know, offer to, to those in all over the state a, a sense that there is a, a, that kind of review and the experts can share uh, publicly as well as the public comment. Um, is that something that, you know, is being considered, a, and I would suggest that it's something that should be done um, to provide more confidence in the community that this re scientific review is something that we can understand better in a public forum? Thank you for your question. You know, I am, um, there are absolutely important roles for transparency. It helps the process in many ways. When it comes to certain types of science, however, um, there is a role for having transparency at a certain point. There has to be an objective period during which time the science is allowed to go where it goes. For example, the, the complexity of some of these studies, when they were done, how, over what period they were studied, how the measurements were taken, um, it, it's, it's much more complex than something that a two-minute public conversation or a testimony can allow. On the other hand, afterwards, Absolutely, check every single assumption, check every single fact, check how we got from where we started to where we are today, and openly look at it, dissect it. The, the issue is when do you do that? And, and right now, it's changing so quickly. There's so many studies coming out that I'm not prepared yet to share that or start that conversation today uh, in a forum that will just add to confusion and will distract from the work that is going on. But, but we, as moving forward, there will be uh, a public um, forum. You know, uh, to the extent that I've been asked to deliver a report to Commissioner Martens, I will deliver my report to Commissioner Martens, and then he can choose to do whatever he likes with it. Well, I, I've, I also just want to close by uh, thanking you for your um, recognizing the shortages in primary care in, in our communities. I think focusing on primary care is essential. It's preventive, and it really uh, helps so many uh, to be able to, um, for, you know, really be healthy as, as, as children, as adults. And, you know, I've seen, as an educator, I've seen too many in our community, as you noted earlier, who do not have the health care. And then they wind up in the emergency room, and not only is it the cost to all of us, um, it's also a cost to them in terms of their lives and quality of life. So uh, as we, I think we need to continue to focus on more access for primary care, and, and I appreciate that effort. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioner. Senator Montgomery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, as you, you have mentioned and you know that uh, we have um, extreme issues in Brooklyn, Kings County, as it relates to uh, health care issues generally, but also uh, several of the hospitals in trouble. And um, you're in, your, um, in your presentation to us, you talk about um, the triple aim and that our health care system relies too heavily on inpatient care, emergency room services, and nursing home care, and not primary care and other community-based alternatives. So my question, um, I, I, I will combine two issues into one. It's uh, regarding the waiver money that we are all hopeful uh, will come. Um, and hopefully it will be um, available to us in a timely enough fashion so that we can actually um, help to stem the tide of, of failure. Um, my question is, 
what um, will be the formula or the process of distributing of the waiver funds, um, and how, in fact, will that be a part of a recovery for the Brooklyn situation? That's one part. And we know that we have a number of um, FQHCs um, that provide health care, which is really uh, a very big part of your triple aim. But I'm not seeing in your presentation or in necessarily in the, in the budget itself um, a focus on those organizations um, that tend to be sort of left out of the equation. And so, um, and they're looking to become more a major part, a central part of the delivery of the healthcare system, particularly as it relates to primary care um, and uh, community-based care. So I would like to see what, what the waiver funding is gonna do for those two areas. So uh, one of the things that we have in our waiver fundings is half a billion dollars for health homes. Now what are health homes? They're constructs of providers, whether it's an FQHC plus a hospital plus an AIDS outreach, groups of providers who come together to work on those chronic patients, those patients who are 5% of the population responsible for 50% of the cost, right? Those are the expensive patients with more than one problem. And those are the folks who are bouncing around the system, not getting the preventive care they need. To a large extent, how are you going to reduce their hospitalizations? It's by integrating them into high quality primary care, often delivered by federally qualified health centers. So that is something that we've had up and running now, and it's been working very well, and we seek a major expansion of that as part of the waiver. The hospital is only going to keep the patient out of the hospital, reach that 25% goal, if they meaningfully partner with primary care and with mental health services and with other community-based services. So while it's a waiver for the hospitals, it's really not about the hospitals where you're going to see all those big gains. A lot of those big gains are only going to occur if hospitals partner with everyone in the community, including FQHCs. And so is that part of the formula for um, distribution of the waiver funding, or how will you, in fact, sure. enforce this? So part to the of extent that they show credible plans, that show how they're going to reach that 25% over five years, only then will the money flow. All of those plans will include successful components that we know that work, including strong partnerships, bi-directional partnerships with community providers, FQHCs and others. So yes, it will be a part of it. It'll be because they can only achieve that 25% reduction mm -hmm. if they meaningfully partner. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, I think I have a, a half a minute that I want to just ask on another issue um, related but not exactly the same, of uh, the school-based health clinics. Um, it is my understanding that as of October, um, they will no longer be carved out. And so that means that they will, um, for the most part, not be covered because they won't be able to survive under the new um, um, system of managed care. So can you give me some idea as to what your plans are to make sure that we don't lose what we already have and that we move toward um, also, they're not FQHCs, but they are a very significant, uh, they play a very significant role in providing health care for, for young people. And actually it's the other way around. The school-based health clinics have done a fantastic job showing how good they are at keeping asthmatic kids out of the hospital yes. emergency room and elsewhere. So what we, as we move to managed care, what we're doing is giving them a more stable, long-term, sustainable funding source rather than the one-offs in the budgets or the exclusions. To the extent that I think of this as a real opportunity, what we've been doing is having very regular meetings with all the stakeholders, with all the folks at school-based clinics, how do you live in a managed care world? What do you need to do between now and October to get there? How will you continue to sell your, your story? How will you partner under the waiver? All of these conversations are happening 
regularly between Medicaid and other parts of the department with school-based clinics, with a working group, so that they can successfully make that transition, and I think they're going to do very well. Well, I look forward to uh, working with you as well to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks in this transition period. So thank you for your support of that. Thank you, Senator. <coughs> thank you, Assemblyman Oaks. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just wanted to build a bit on uh, Chairman Gottfried's uh, discussion of the prior authorization on the off-label uh, drugs. Uh, can you tell me what drug classes there might be that are being uh, prescribed uh, off-label or for off-label use and, and then maybe some specific examples uh, of some of those drugs? So I can tell you there is an epidemic of our children, of our youth, being prescribed very active um, medications that affect brains over time. Uh, expensive medications, antipsychotics, they have not been studied in children. There is the assumption that they will help with behavioral issues in the classroom, and as a result, kids will be able to participate in normal classrooms. There has been an epidemic of sorts in this regard. To the extent that this is largely, almost exclusively off-label and of real concern to me, this is one example where we might be able to ramp that back with such a policy. Uh, if, if you have an opportunity uh, as a follow-up, you know, I'd be interested in seeing, uh, you, you know, again, you gave that class, uh, looking at others and or some of the specifics that, that, that we are concerned about as a state. Uh, it, also, I wanted to bring up the general public health work uh, program and its expansion to include uh, prenatal uh, care. Will all of the women who are receiving the prenatal care be required to enroll in a health insurance uh, program? No, I think the, 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 the goal of that is to really try to get insurers to pay when they should be paying. And on the other hand, for women who don't have access through any other means to still have that safety net. So the, the, so the goal is that let's get the right folks with the right pockets paying, not to really cut services, but to cut the costs to the state while still retaining a strong safety net so no one's left behind. Uh, an extension of that is, the, uh, medica in the, uh, is trying to extend the nurse family partnership, for example. We're trying to get first time Medicaid moms to actually have a nurse visit them in the home every month through pregnancy and for two years after. That's an example of a, a service that we're extending and expanding on so that the safety net is stronger because there's a strong evidence base that it works. Do, will counties uh, be negatively impacted if they uh, don't make a good faith effort to uh, assist with enrolling, uh, you, you know, the uh, I, I, moms? And, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, you, there is some wording, as I understand it, of you know, of making a good faith effort of enrollment, um, and so it, it was just kind of looking. Now there will be eligible if the counties don't come through, you know. Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is in everyone's best interest. It's in the mom's best interest to be in a high quality program, not just one service. It's in the county's best interest to get out of the business of uh, which they're, you know, they've been doing for a while, but they're getting more and more out of as insurance companies and others are picking up and focusing more on their pu public health and other areas. So there will be a transition period. I, I can assure you that we will watch it very co carefully and make sure that any, um, any transition issues uh, that occur will be addressed in real time. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Senator Hassel Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. <laughs> um, I have a, a series of quick questions. One, um, I just wanted clarification. Earlier you said um, that regions know what their area health needs are, and I agree with that. But then you went on to talk about a regional concept for health care, and I was hoping that you would not 
paralleling that with the economic <coughs> development, um, regional economic plans, which makes it competitive. You did not mean that. No. Oh, great. Okay. Then I can move on to my next question. Um, I, like you, am, am very pleased to hear that there are only two new cases of maternal child transmission of HIV and AIDS. But um, how does that stack up against HIV and AIDS in the African American community when 12 and 22 year old new cases are being found every day? We have not won the battle. What we are suggesting is that we can, by 2020, commit to the prevalence of HIV and AIDS in New York State going down for the first time in history. What I'm suggesting is we know we've won uh, the battle for maternal to child transmission, for IV drug abusers, but there are men who have sex with men and African American and other populations where we need much more efforts. What we're proposing is a plan that gets to that. For example, there are uh, people who have HIV or AIDS. There are uh, who are in the system but then drop out of the system. How do we engage them back in the system? Well, maybe they're getting a blood test for something else, or maybe they're getting care somewhere else. Let's use that to get them back in, in, into care. What we are proposing is a full plan that looks at African Americans in particular, but all the vulnerable populations where we haven't made enough gains, and working with the community to identify those patients, and to get them into care. There is a, a lot of patients who don't know their diagnosis. There are tens of thousands of New Yorkers today living with HIV who don't know they have HIV. Let's get them diagnosed. All of that is part of the plan. And a large part of that burden falls on underserved minority communities. That's where our focus will be. Well, what is the plan for the 12 to 22 year old? The, you know, the plan that you're talking about sounds good for that particular population, but what are your educational and awareness plans for the 12 year old? So to the extent that we're working with the community partners uh, in tandem and they're helping drive the agenda, we're working with them to say this is how we identify these patients, this is how we get them into care, this is how we prevent it in the first place among the 12 to 22 year olds. I'm not relying on just the AIDS Institute to, to solve all the problems. Our community partners who have had a long history of very successful advocacy on behalf of these populations are going to be fundamental to the success. And my last question is, um, the federal guidelines for um, the standards for pre-K, you know, includes health care services. How does your budget reflect this increase in services to this new population or increased population as the governor, um, you know, rolls out his pre-K plan? So again, that's a great question where we're looking from the whole continuum. How do we first catch kids? and take care of them throughout their con the continuum of their lives to keep them healthy. And we spoke earlier about school-based clinics. That's an example where school-based clinics, as they expand, as they have a stable funding source through managed care, they will have opportunities to think creatively outside of the box to actually engage new populations. We know that taking care of a kid and keeping him or her healthy is much better than paying for the diabetes or the uh, knee replacement or the heart transplant after the fact. So when we're getting, what we've, we're doing is we're actually for the first time building that system of healthcare so we can make the right investments at the earliest stage possible. All right, but currently, um, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, school-based <coughs> clinics have been targeted toward junior high and high school <coughs> students. How, do, you know, pre-Ks are very different kettle of fish, and we haven't done this in a universal sense. Right. So what is the plan for, how would school-based clinics affect this particular population? I'm suggesting school-based clinics as one potential alternative. It is not yet real. It is an, op an opportunity out there. To date, what we do with funding through CHIP, Child Health Plus, and other uh, early intervention and other programs already have points of contact with the pre-K population. To the extent that pediatricians need to be paid more, that the patient-centered medical home model needs to be strengthened, all of these kinds of things can help pre-K kids outside the school. There may be opportunities as we see school-based services expand to also think inside the school because that's where you can reach them, that's where they spend a lot of their time, and that's where you can start to influence the family, not just the child. 
You're speaking conceptually. That's right, because it is, it is but still But you're a speaking concept. conceptually. I, my question was budgetarily. Where is it in the budget? It, you know, because while you're talking about pre-K as it currently exists, the governor and everybody is talking about expanding on that number significantly. And I'm not clear that your budget reflects that. That's, that's my question. I understand the concept. But I want to I want to see it in the budget. Okay. Thank you. Assemblywoman Millman. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think I still can get in. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, yes, I know. I will have to speak fast so I get it all in in the morning session. Um, one question that um, that I still don't understand is, as you as you know, uh, I'm the uh, assembly member who represents one of these very distressed hospitals in Brooklyn, and yet um, and very much looking forward to getting our our share of the Medicaid waiver. But I don't understand why I've been told several times that when we are successful, and I certainly hope that we'll be successful as soon as you alluded to earlier, why this uh, Medicaid uh, re refund for us, and it is a refund in a lot of ways, uh, will, not, will not address the needs at Long Island College Hospital. Could you expand on that? Sure. So the Long Island College Hospital is a different situation than uh, Interfaith, specifically. To the extent that we're working with SUNY and working with SUNY on their RFP and helping them along in terms of their thinking, SUNY and the local courts are, are really in charge there. We are here to provide any support that's needed, but it's, uh, again, the, the purposes of the dollars from the waiver have to meet very specific needs. It have to, they have to show how you are going to reduce admissions by 25%, those ambulatory sensitive admissions and uh, unneeded admissions. Only then will any institution or institutions get such dollars, right? That kind of transformation can occur with interfaith. Lich is a different story. Lich is already, you know, they're, they're on their own right now with SUNY and us helping as much as we can, but that's a process that they are controlling and that, that is moving forward independent of the waiver process. And so uh, we're now in the process uh, with the um, new and improved, if you will, and I don't think it's new or improved, but RFP process, um, which is due at uh, the end of today, where the um, SUNY has allowed the firms, if you will, to reapply. And if one of those applications um, comes through as the most successful one and addresses some of the concerns that you expressed before, um, then could the waiver then be used if one of these were to be successful? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. All right, thank you. Let me, let me ask you about something totally different. Um, as chair of the aging committee, We've spent a lot of time talking uh, about the, um, a crucial element in our aging population, and that's the AIDS, epi not the, well, AIDS is also something that's cropped up, but I want to talk about Alzheimer's. And it is now close to $2 million that's sitting somewhere, um, and it comes about uh, for, as people who have uh, done a check off on their income tax, and it's supposed to go for AIDS for Alzheimer's concerns. And yet none of that money's gotten out the door. And it's close, I think it's 1.8 million now. That was the last number that I got. So it's close to $2 million. So what is the department doing to see that that money gets to the organizations that are doing such fine work in all parts of our state? Yes, thank you for that question. And it is an important um, epidemic that we need to address as well with the aging population. We have actually over the last month started to come up with very specific plans on how to move that money and most meaningfully work on early diagnosis and uh, you know getting folks into treatment as quickly as possible with those monies. And at some point in the near future, I'm sure we'll be ready to share those plans with you. We will reach out to you directly. Um, and then before I leave this topic, if that's the last, uh, last question that I have for you, 
What, what caused the delay? Because people have been checking that off for some time now. This is not just something new that happened. I mean, for that many people to, to put whatever small amount it is to come out of their income tax refund, to, to collect, yeah, collect a lot of what happened? To, why was there such a delay? So there are delays in, in, you know, across the board because of sometimes the nature of the law may not allow for uh, expeditious spending of the money. I'll give you a real example. Uh, with the prostate cancer checkoff box. It was only one organization in California that was specifically named that could get the money. We need a change of the law. And in the governor's executive budget, we have proposed that change in the law so that we can expend those funds. To the extent that there are different issues where money has been unspent, uh, we are <coughs> trying to address actually about six different areas uh, in this executive uh, budget that Governor Cuomo has uh, proposed. So I can expect from you at the time that we do something in terms of which organizations will be the benefactory of the uh, beneficiaries of this money. I'll hear something from you on that front. You will hear a full update on where we are and what our plans are shortly. Thank you very much. Senator Golden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony this morning. And we're looking forward to working with you and the governor to get this Medicaid waiver. It's important that we get it, uh, the federal waiver, so that we can uh, help those 237 distressed hospitals across the state. So we're looking forward to working with you to get that accomplished. I understand we had $17 billion in savings for the federal government, which I presume it was a $17 billion in savings to ourselves as well. So it's a $34 billion spending savings. I'm sorry, not a spending, but a savings. Could you get a breakdown for us, for myself, so that I can have a better argument as I present these arguments to the federal government? We have some press releases going on, and we'd like to have how we were able to save that $34 billion for the state, and if the chairs of this committee could get it as well. So the question related to how do we save $34 billion, we're on track to save $34 billion. To be honest, we've saved $4.6 billion the first year alone, and we're on track to save $34 billion combined state and federal. A lot of large programs led to these savings. Uh, one has been the commitment to the global cap. As we committed to a global cap, it's now 3.8% rise in Medicaid this year. What that has done is that has changed provider behavior. They know that we're looking at them and that we're reporting out on a monthly basis to the dollar how much each sector is spending, how much is going toward nursing homes, how much is going toward uh, managed care. Can I get a one-page memo on that? I'm sorry? Can I get a one-page memo on that? Uh, you, you, would you like a report on that? Yes, yes absolutely. please. Yes, it's, uh, we'll, we'll send you uh, the monthly reports going back from Thank the beginning you. of the program. Thank you. Um, there was money distributed, 170, 150, $160 million out of HEAL money. I believe there was an announcement last week of about 56 million or 57 million was distributed. A large chunk of that went to Brooklyn Hospital and to the Brooklyn Hospitals. I understand that Luther Medical was at that table in the discussions. I understand that they're working on a margin of a 0.26 profit, uh, which is not exactly a big profit margin. Um, but they obviously were not chosen at the end of the uh, process. So they were looking for $9 million over a three year period to combine their billing systems, and we know that the waiver does not take into consideration IT or capital. Uh, is there going to be additional dollars that are going to be, is any additional money going to be going out? My impression is that the waiver and the capital monies are the only sources to date. But to the extent that when you pay for something, like bricks and mortar, that they had money for, they can repurpose their own money to use it on something else. And what we're looking for is the strongest applications that take all of that into account so that a system stays strong and grows. So there, there is no other money. There are no other pots of money beyond the waiver and the governor's $1.2 in capital. Well, they turn around there in desperate need of dollars. So if there's somebody I can sit with your office with in the future, short in the near future, to figure out how we're going to keep them alive, it's important that that uh, hospital does not become uh, one of those hospitals in the red uh, very shortly. Brooklyn has enough issues going on. We need to keep those that are in the black in the black, and I think they need that funding. The uh, tobacco. 
Uh, we came to the 11th hour in getting a bill passed that would put more investigators on the streets going after the uh, illegal cigarettes and tobacco on the streets, costing this state probably close to a billion dollars. Uh, we do know that if we were out there with these investigators and the price of cigarettes were what they should be, uh, cigarettes would go down and obviously health care would become better here in the state of New York. If you could chime in with uh, the governor's office and uh, uh, powers to be that we need uh, to get this uh, closed uh, this as soon as possible so that we can get more investigators on the street. Uh, every other store in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx is selling illegal cigarettes. Every other store. On stamped from Virginia, from Texas, from China, they're from all over. It is a shame. It is the new drug uh, in uh, across this state. And I go to these stores, it's pretty embarrassing. So if you could please uh, chime in, we'd need your help in getting that bill done and uh, getting uh, more investigators on the street. Um, I understand that our, the uh, hospitals, our research hospitals, are of a concern that we're losing some of our researchers and we're gonna lose more of our researchers and our star scientists. Uh, I believe the Texas has put in $3 billion uh, for cancer research. California put in multi-billions of dollars for stem cell. Connecticut's put in a billion dollars for biomed and biotech. Uh, do you have the same fears, doctor? We have uh, been very proactive about addressing the loss of scientists in our academic medical centers with a total re-envisioning of our ECRIP program. And that's on the tune of, I think, about $18 million. Uh, obviously, the stem cell found, uh, funding and becoming more competitive for federal funds. So as a scientist and as a researcher, absolutely I'm in tune with this, and I'm looking at any and all advantages New York researchers can get uh, as they compete for federal and other funds. Uh, we've, we have been uh, actually quite successful in stem cell funding, leading to more stem cell researchers in New York uh, relative to other states, and I'm hoping that with the ECRIP program, we can continue on that tradition and expand it, extend it to other areas. The, uh, we see the, uh, we have a bill that's coming out that's, uh, that deals with biotech, biomed, and incubators, and that incentivizes them uh, to operate here in this city and state of New York and to give more opportunities for these researchers and star scientists to stay here. Hopefully you'll get a look at that and hopefully you can sort, support that bill. That bill will be coming out shortly. Um, the eye stop that we were so good at uh, doing uh, and uh, uh, limiting the prescription pills and I'm going to tell you in my community Oxycontin seems to be going down and uh, prescription drugs seem to be going down but heroin seems to be the new uh, drug of choice not only in the areas of Brooklyn but where the uh, Staten Island and Long Island uh, it seems to be rampant. Um, any comment on that? You know, absolutely. We know that, and we're watching very closely and working with law enforcement partners to make sure that as we uh, enforce with iStop, we also provide a lifeline with adequate treatment and, and program. So to try to get folks who don't have access anymore to get on the off-ramp rather than switch to illegal Are substances. you seeing the same results? Anecdotally. I don't have numbers to back that up. Thank you. Last question. The um, I'm sure the Senator Hannon may have dealt with this already, and if it did, um, just ignore it and we'll move on. The uh, in-network and out-of-network, uh, we dealt with the out-of-network situation when it came to emergency care. Um, everybody is in uh, network if it's an emergency situation. If it's not an emergency situation, it's a planned uh, procedure, such as a transplant, um, and you want to go into the city of New York to have that done. A, you have problems because the hospitals, they have limited number of plans. Some of them have no plans. And uh, out of network is definitely a situation uh, for the residents in uh, the areas that I represent and I'm sure for many of my colleagues. Are we going to require um, some form of out of network policy uh, for these plans? It's premature to discuss our plans. I can just tell you that we are adequate, we are monitoring network ad adequacy continuously 
And as uh, any issues crop up, we will make appropriate changes. Because it is definitely onerous on an individual to make sure if you're having a transplant, then you're going to have 30, 40 people in and out of your room uh, over a course of three to four weeks to make sure that every individual is in network. Uh, that's onerous to the individual that's having those procedures done and uh, can be quite costly. So you can understand the importance of that one. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Abenati. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, the, the last field that we were just talking about. Um, there are reports that um, the health plans that were obtained through the health marketplace um, have not reached an agreement with the Westchester County Medical Center. And as of now, uh, none of the people who have those plans can access the Westchester County Medical Center, which is the major trauma center north of New York City. And as I understand it, the only real trauma center between New York City and, and Albany. What is your department doing to resolve this problem? So we are absolutely monitoring that to the extent that uh, in an emergency uh, situation, for example, trauma, car accident. Doctor, thank you. I don't have much time. I understand the, the theory behind it, and I appreciate your monitoring it. I'd like to know what your department is doing. Are you intervening? Are you working with the, uh, the medical center? And, the, uh, and what are you doing? For trauma services in an emergency situation, they would be covered. That's not my understanding today. How did you come to that conclusion? Uh, we'll check. I'll get back to you. But that's thank you very much. Uh, next, I'd like to move on to, uh, you were talking about a database program. Is this going to be tied into the P20 or whatever that program is that the uh, State Education Department is using? I'm not sure what, what database program you're talking P12, about. P12, I don't know. There's some large database that the Education Department is trying to put together to monitor and track children from the age of three through uh, adulthood. Is this going to be part of that? I have no plans to work with, uh, I, I, I am not aware of that program, and I have not had discussions with state education about combining any databases with their Okay, now, P20. who is going to hold all of this data that you're proposing for a statewide system? I assume you're talking about the statewide health information network, New York? Yes, sir. Shiny? Okay. So that is actually um, something that today all the regions already have. There are 10 regions, RIOs, regional health information organizations. And who holds the data today? The regions. Who, who is the region? So, for example, here, or, or let's say in in, uh, in, um, in 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 Manhattan, right? There, there are uh, the hospitals have set up a system where they connect to each other and they have servers where they store data in a secure format, so that when a patient gets admitted to one hospital versus right, another, right? That's the hospitals with their own private databases and linking them together. They form their own little internet. When we, go on, when we go on a statewide system, are you talking about giving this to a private company? No. So who is, who's going to be in charge of the database? There will be, it's a federated system where the data is local, but it's connected. We're building the pipes. What we're suggesting is building the But this will be pipes. state employees that will be managing this. There will be state oversight. Of that's, state, that's different than state employees. That's correct. Are we going to have outside contractors doing this? We will have outside contractors doing it who are currently doing it today. The Rios are all is, outside contractors. And who's doing contractors. background checks on these outside contractors and who's making sure that this data is secure? Absolutely. That, that is my primary concern, is that the data is secure. My question was and who is who doing, is doing it? that not, today? Not is it your concern? For example, KPMG does audits. Excuse me? KPMG is one of the auditors that audits these to maintain the security of these. Well, Target private. thought it was secure also. I'm concerned about making sure that this data remains secure, and I wanted to know who is in charge of this. Who, to, who are you planning to give this contract to who is going to hold the uh, medical, clinical, patient data of every person in the state? No one will hold all that data. What we're creating is a network which will allow co connections across the system. So when you get in a car accident in Buffalo, they can pull up your medical records from Brooklyn. That kind of thing already exists at regional levels. Right. What we're doing is we're building the pipes to connect it at a statewide level. Anytime anyone accesses any of that data, there's a full audited trail of who accessed it, and who when, does the, why, who does where. And who does the audit? KPMG. Is that available to us to look at? I am not aware that it is available to the public or anyone right now. I know that they are one of the contractors who adequately provides oversight to federal standards of HIPAA, 
to make sure that the data is secure and private. That is my primary right. concern, is the security and privacy of that data. Uh, doctor, you, you were talking about the Medicaid redesign team, uh, and we we're talking about managed care for people with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, how is that going? We are going slowly, and we are making sure that all patients will be ultimately cared for in systems. The, uh, the DD issue is one of those things that we're working on over time and will delay it or, or accelerate it as needed to make sure that patients um, get what they need. I'm glad to hear you're not rushing into it without following it carefully. Uh, do we have a survey of how many uh, psychiatrists and how many mental health professionals actually belong to networks today? To belong to whom? Belong to the networks that you're hoping to move these into? I don't have that data. Has the, has the health department done that data? I am not aware. I, I would assume that if you're talking about the developmentally disabled, that you're talking about OPWDD, and perhaps that commissioner might have that information for you. Well, isn't it your department that's, that's moving forward on the Medicaid redesign? Absolutely, and we would work with them on that level of data. Because I'm, I'm concerned, I'm hearing from mental health professionals, that most of them do not belong to networks, that many of them are not physicians, and so they're going to be losing their clients, in effect, but the, but the impact is on the clients. They'll find another way to make a living. But it's on the clients who are now going to not be able to use their current mental health uh, professionals because the mental health professionals are not part of the networks that are being used for the Medicaid redesign. To the extent that we want to minimize any and all disruptions, especially when it comes to mental health services, that will be closely watched and tracked. We've That'll be watched seen... and tracked, but you haven't done any surveys yet to see how many mental health professionals uh, match up with uh, the networks you're planning to use. No, I said I'm not aware of those. I said maybe the commissioner of OPWDD is aware, or we can find out of that information and get it back to you. Okay, lastly, on the early intervention, I share my colleague's concern, because I believe that what you're espousing here is good theory, but is in fact very different from what's happening on the street. I have a stack of letters right in front of me now that came in January 15th, January 20th, indicating that while the percentages of claims being paid has in fact increased, the amount of money outstanding has not. And it's the amount of money that is out there that is a major burden on the providers. And that in fact now, a large number of these professionals not the providers, but the professionals who provide the services, like the behavioral therapists, have left the field. There is a limited number of them. They're in great demand. They can go do something else in their fields. They don't have to do early intervention. And that now we have a major backlog of parents trying to get services for their kids, even in a place like Westchester County where there's lots of providers. And as you understand, if we have just a month's delay, for a child who's a few months old. That's a major, major problem. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Gibson. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you uh, recall that recently the CDC re released some numbers uh, stating that they had discovered that there were 10 times more cases of tick-borne illness across the country than we had previously thought. Um, and uh, based on the research uh, that's been provided by the health department, um, they have been uh, steadily decreasing funding uh, in terms of uh, research related to trying to find preventative ways to uh, deal with uh, our rising health crisis of tick-borne illness here in New York State. In fact, in the last uh, six years, the funding has decreased over 50 percent. Could you explain why that decrease in funding is occurring while the cases of uh, tick-borne illness are rising in New York State? At the federal level? No, at the state level. So state. to the extent that we are recipients of many of the federal grants. And right, but the state, uh, the state itself, within what the state can control, obviously, within our budget, um, there has been a steady decrease in the amount of funding that we're devoting internally to, to, this, to the Tick Disease uh, Institute within your health department. Sure. So that, that, thank you for your question. So to the extent that absolutely tick-borne illness is, is something that we take very seriously as a public health issue and we are monitoring it all the time, we are working with the, we are the recipients of multiple federal grants now to actually conduct primary research on tick-borne illnesses. Could, could I just um, interrupt to ask how that grant funding will be distributed because um, in the current proposed executive budget, um, there seems to be sort of a bundling of all money related to infectious disease. It seems like uh, what's going to be happening is that uh, tick-borne illness 
HIV AIDS, hepatitis, STDs, mumps, rabies, rubella, but that's all going to be put into a competitive grant pool. Are we going to have infectious disease groups sort of compete like an NCAA, NCAA basketball tournament where there's sort of a bracketed competition and we have to pit these groups against each other? That doesn't seem to be an effective way to deal with infectious disease. No, actually it's the other way around. What we're doing is we're making their lives easier. It was the same group who was getting money from multiple different buckets. Now they have one consolidated bucket and if you'll notice, the funding is the same. So our intent with this bucketing is to actually make the lives of the recipients easier, make the lives of the department easier, to do one big grant to a given organization instead of three separate across three separate buckets as in the past. And so this is actually a good thing uh, in this year's budget. But does that, mean that, does that mean that every infectious disease organization within the health department will be, will be receiving funding? In other words, for instance, in tick, with the tick-borne illness issue, um, the Tick uh, Disease Institute within your commission, um, if, if it could not uh, you know, meet whatever qualifications that are needed to receive that competitive grant funding, would it just not receive any funding? And the same thing with uh, HIV AIDS. Do they have to show some kind of proof to be eligible for this money? Will, will all of these groups get the funding they need, or is it going to be competitive? It's the same thing as last year, the same money, the same groups will get the money to the same level of funding, okay, so but with, instead of three applications, one, for example. So, so last year, you know, the... It's a very different proposal than last year's buckets. Okay, last year the Tick-Borne tick Disease Institute received $50,000. Is that the amount of money they're going to receive again this year? I can't say. I don't know uh, what they're going to ask for, what their scope of proposal is, but on average, our intent with this was to make sure that every group who gets funding from the Department of Health in those various buckets continues to maintain that level of funding but with administrative simplification. Does it make sense to you when the CDC comes out and says that we have 10 times more cases of tick-borne illness in, New York, in, in, uh, in the country, knowing that New York State is one of the leaders in tick-borne illness, that this is an epidemic that's really rising here within our state. We have the opportunity to be a leader in trying to bring uh, some kind of resolution to it to help those that are really suffering right now. Does it make sense to you that we only gave them $50,000 within the State Health Commission's budget last year? That seems like an incredibly small amount of money. It does seem like a, lot, a small amount of money, but it's also about not that there's 10 times more cases, it's that there's 10 times more recognition. So it's the cases have stayed the same. We just understand the problem is bigger than it was. And so what we will do is work within our systems and with our partners to make sure that we use every available tool to address it. There are now today, compared to five years ago, many more opportunities to get lab results together in ways that we didn't before. Our Wadsworth lab does a lot of the testing specifically around this. So we're, we're actually looking to make the program better at many different levels, and I'm happy to brief you on that at your leisure. You know, I, along with uh, many other people here, uh, you know, have various bills in that would propose that we increase the funding to, uh, to do research and uh, preventative measures for tick-borne illness. Would you support an increased measure of funding, a substantial increase, say a million dollars um, increase uh, to, this, to this issue? You know, I, I support, uh, <laughs> to the extent that I support for SCURB, for prostate cancer, for cystic fibrosis, for sickle cell, there are many competing issues. And I am in favor of supporting anyone and everyone who can show what they're going to give as a result of it. And can so I ask, very um, that way. sorry, thank you. Can I ask, how much money are we spending on the, the health study for, for fracking? I, I can't seem to get a number on that. What is the total that we've spent to date on studying the, the health impact of fracking? We've spent uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. So we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars studying a substance such as natural gas. We can't, we can't drink it. We can't use it to irrigate our crops. But we're only spending $50,000 on researching something like tick-borne illness, which is affecting people right now. I mean, right now, people are really, really suffering from this disease. I would hope that you would advocate for, for uh, an extreme uh, addition to, to the funding that we're currently providing and, 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 and allow New York State to take the lead in really trying to help those people that are, have no other place to look right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Assemblyman, Assemblyman Crouch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commissioner. Thank you for your, your time here. <clears throat> About uh, four years ago, I had some health facilities in my district were cited for some violations of uh, how they disposed of pharmaceuticals, which they thought they were doing the correct thing at the time. 
Uh, but it was noted that at that time there were different regulations with DEC, Department of Health, and even uh, from the federal government on disposal of narcotics, uh, in regard to, especially in regard to flushing. And my inquiry at that time, I was told that DEC and DOH were working to uh, consolidate their regulations and make them consistent. Is that, has that been done? Are they still differing regulations as far as uh, pharmaceutical disposals? I'm not aware of that very specific regulation. I know that what we have done over the past year is we've made many more places that can accept pharmaceuticals. For example, uh, working with state police uh, on uh, disposal of pharmaceuticals, working on take-back programs with pharma pharmacies, working to advance the opportunities so things aren't left in the uh, medicine cabinet or flushed down the toilet, educating people that when you're done with them, bring them back, not right. flush them down the toilet. I can't speak to that specific regulation. I can look it up and, and get back. Well, it's not a specific regulation, but it's, it's a number of regulations, in my understanding, that of how you handle and dispose of pharmaceuticals, whether it's DEC's regulations or Department of Health. And I was told at the time, anyways, that DOH and DEC were working to try to make everything consistent and obviously trying to bring the federal narcotics in, involved in it because uh, they have some different regulations on top of that. So uh, one other thing, in my district, we have a, uh, the home, veterans, one of the veterans' homes, and I've been there a number of times. Beautiful facility, and I will say that uh, there's a lot of dedicated staff there. They do a great job in caring for our veterans, and, and the veterans all seem to be uh, very happy and healthy and, and very content of where they are. Uh, occasionally, I'm visiting a veteran that I know of. There's, there's a comment that, that they're short-staffed. Um, I just want to put in a plug that uh, these are our veterans. And I guess a question, are there open slots at any of our veterans' homes that aren't being filled because of a hiring freeze or anything that you know of? Not that I'm aware of. I know that we have staffed up uh, Helen Hayes and our veterans' homes over the past year and a half. Okay. Uh, I can certainly look into furthering. I know that we are also in the final stages of hiring uh, two people to oversee all of our facilities, and they will have uh, an opportunity to take their own uh, first-hand look at the veterans' home. And I, I'll be honest, uh, the one gentleman I talked to hadn't made a comment in probably at least a year at this point in time, so the staffing might have been fulfilled. And I just, uh, these are our veterans. These are World War II Korean veterans that fought for our country, and uh, they are near and dear to all of our hearts. So I would just uh, hope you take that into consideration and make sure that the staffing levels are appropriate and so they're not getting stressed out and, and our veterans are getting the care that they really need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Kruger. Good afternoon. I thought someone else would ask this question so I could take my name off the list, but they didn't, although many of my questions have already been answered. Um, the governor's proposing in, in the executive budget um, the creation of the basic health program within the ACA, and my understanding is that that could actually help us increase coverage for a large number of New Yorkers who are quite poor between 133% and 200% of the federal poverty level, but not currently eligible um, for insurance. Could you explain a little bit about why you think this is actually so important? Why that is so important? Yes, yes it is absolutely it important. Impacted. We're just, the problem is we're waiting for the feds again for their guidance after which we can actually advance the program. And this is going to be, um, again, another example where the, the system currently has a lot of gaping holes in it in terms of coverage. And this is one of those that we need to do a better job on. The existence of such a basic health plan will help with the continuum of coverage across uh, our populations across the ages, and it'll be a high quality health plan. So our, our hope is that we'll get federal guidance soon and we could start ramping up the, our own program. The reality is we can't do anything until we get more from the feds in terms of very specific uh, guidance around their program. Do you know, do you have an estimate of how many New Yorkers could be covered by this program if the feds go forward? I'm sure that Donna Frescator has that number or Jason Hulgerson has that number. I know it's a significant number, and I also know that this will also help with New York State's currently, current system of uh, funding where a lot of people will be transitioned into this high-quality basic health plan. 
And in fact, I guess two groups had done some modeling before the ACA started, and they were estimating um, we could have state savings up to $900 million to $1 billion. Do you know if your department can confirm that um, that could be this large at this point? I've heard north of $300 million, uh, but then that would probably also reflect a ramp-up period, so I don't know where that would land. And do you, we have any estimate of when the feds might be letting us know? Because that's not part of the Medicaid waiver we're waiting for, right? That's a no, different... That's, everyone's waiting oh. for this, and okay. uh, that's part of the problem. Got it. So, so we don't know. And if it happened tomorrow, could we start to implement in the new budget year? I doubt it, given the nature of the, and the complexity of the program. Obviously, it's in everyone's benefit. So to the extent that the sooner we get the guidance, the sooner we'll ramp it up as quickly as possible. Um, that's, that's our intent. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblywoman Rosenthal. Thank you, Thank you uh, Dr. Shah, um, for your previous comments. Um, a lot of people in my district and a lot of people, which is the Upper West Side and parts of Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan, um, but they are very concerned about their drinking water, but not just that, they're concerned about the impact of fracking on the entire state. So I know you've been asked questions about the health study. Um, I know DEC held hearings um, to get input and got tens of thousands of <laughs> comments about the fracking. But for the health study portion, did the health department conduct any kind of um, open hearing to receive comments about it? No. Do you, so you don't have to under, under the process? I was just asked of a very specific series of charges by Commissioner Martens to review the state of the SGEIS and to give recommendations on its adequacy relative to protecting the health of New Yorkers. My health review will do that. I will deliver it to him when I'm comfortable, at which point he can decide what he wants to do with it. Okay. So when, when was that begun? I'm sorry? When did that process <coughs> begin internally? Uh, a, November of not last year, the year before. November of 12. 2012? Yes. Okay. So can you describe how that process has been going on in your office? Like, who's assigned to it? How many people are assigned to it? What is the scope of their investigation? So the scope of the investigation has been publicly described, and we have talked about the specific charges of what we're looking at. We're looking at ongoing, existing uh, studies across, that impact health related to high-volume hydrofracking. Okay. To the extent that there were over 40 such studies published last year alone, uh, we are reviewing them. And we have adequate staff between ourselves and others to make sure that we understand each study as it comes out relative to its uh, pertinence to New York. You know, is this a study done in 1996 uh, when they were using very different chemicals in a very different place? Does it relate to Marcellus Shale or is it different sets of conditions relative to ours? So we've had a series of questions that we've been asking as studies come out. We look at its relevance, we look at its pertinence, we look at its actual health relevance, and we're starting to put together our understanding across all areas of health, what does high volume hydrofracking uh, impact? And if it does, how do you mitigate it? What do you do with it? All, all of those questions are on the, uh, on the public, uh, in the public debate already. How many staff members do you have uh, dedicated to this study? It varies depending on when. So early on we had more, now we have fewer. To the extent that it varies over time as new studies come out, we're also working with our federal partners, we're working with folks in Pennsylvania, we're working with uh, folks in California and Illinois and Texas. It varies depending on the studies that come out. As they come out, we bring appropriate attention to them. Okay, I, I appreciate that, but I, I'd like to know in terms of sheer numbers. Do you have three people in your office or, you know, 10 people? Can, can you give me a better picture? Yeah, it, it can be up to several dozen people. It can be as few as <laughs> maybe half a dozen on any given time. Okay. Um, there were some recent reports, um, I think it was about Pennsylvania that um, animals were dying and it, it is the veritable canary in the coal mine, although these are, these are land animals who have been 
affected by the, the water runoff that's toxic and they've been exposed, they've been drinking it, and other, other um, scenarios. Um, do those kinds of things trouble you? Animals dying absolutely trouble me. From, well, I didn't mean to throw you a softball. I meant in relation to um, the adverse effects of fracking in those areas where there has been fracking and then the runoff or the, what, what scientists say are the result of fracking that has directly affected the lives, health of the animals. We're looking at all available evidence that potentially could impact on our review of human health. Okay. So to the extent that there are studies that are very good and there are studies that are very bad. Like we are what's a bad all study? What's a bad study? A bad study. <laughs> a bad study is one that has no relationship to what might potentially happen in New York. A good study is one that has potential impact on human health, well described, well characterized, with conditions similar to New York State. Okay, but conditions in New York State aren't aren't set yet. That's right? exactly the point. Why, so how do you? So I'm not done yet. Well, I mean, which comes first? It's a work in progress. To the extent that you, if, you know, what, I, what I've said in the past is that with human health, I'm not willing to take any chances. And I will take the time it takes. There are, for example, large studies coming out from the feds on water impacts related to health. When there is a tipping point of data that can point you one way or another, my report will be ready. As of today, there is no tipping point. Okay, what, can you describe what the tipping point might be? And I'll tell you why I keep asking you this, yeah. is because so many people around the state are very anxious to hear where this administration um, comes out on this issue. Uh, you know that there's a, a wealth of opposition. There are some who are for it, but those of course, of course are usually have a personal stake in it or a monetary stake, as in the corporations. But, you know, it, if this goes forward and there's a, a mistake, it's not something we can take back. So I understand you're, you're interested in having a robust study come out. So to the extent that as we have, we're guided by the science, we attempt to do what we do in a space where we're objective, we're clear, and it's reproducible, to the extent that when we're done, anyone can challenge any or all of our assumptions, that will be an opportunity for you and everyone else to say, this works, this doesn't work for me. Right now, it's very emotional, and we're staying away from the emotions. We're sticking to the science as much as possible. I don't have a date because I don't know if that one definitive study on health is going to come out tomorrow or it'll never come out. The reality is there is an accumulating body of evidence. It's changing over time. The studies that you refer to go back to 1996 in terms of human health. There are other studies that are more recent. The nature of the industry has changed over time. It is a moving target. And so I don't have a tipping point clarified until I see it. And, and, and the point is, it will be public at some point. When it is public, everyone will have an opportunity to look at all of the assumptions, all of the studies included, and challenge any or all of our uh, findings. Thank you. Wait, I have, I'm sorry, I have no, one no. last, no, one sentence, one, one sentence. I you have two questions to me. I'm sorry, I meant one point. topic. My one final thing is I have a, a packet here of 150 peer-reviewed studies that just came out in 2013, compiled by physicians, <coughs> scientists, and engineers for healthy and energy, so I'd like to submit them on the record for your perusal and, and the people in your department to look for they are recent studies, which I think will be helpful in your study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions, and Senator Hannon will close for the Senate when it's our turn again. Uh, first of all, I, I can't let this uh, early childhood intervention non-payment or late payment issue go by. Last year, when you were here, Senator Hannon asked some brilliant questions about the implementation by April of last year. And you said there would be no problem with that. In October, that six months later, I wrote a letter to you basically talking about exactly what everybody's complaining about today. Payments weren't being made in time. 
Your, what you said at the hearing certainly didn't happen. In fact, it still hasn't happened. You know when I got a response to that letter? Two months later, during which no doubt providers went under. Two months later, I kept calling, getting some bits and pieces. Uh, I mean, is there some reason that the legislature can't get answers on a timely basis from your office? I certainly hope not. I mean, that, that's well, something Well, this isn't that we the only to... area. Let me get next to the point I want to raise. You said that right now we're, you're happy to report 91% of something was being paid. In what period of time were they being paid from the time of submission to the time of payment? This was data as of last week. So to the extent that there was a lot of catching up to do, I can't tell you on average whether it was two weeks, two months, or two years. So what does 91% mean? That means that compared to historical levels, a year ago where we were, before any of this started, a year ago, how many people were paid and what, uh, that's the rate we're paying them out today. Exactly, but over what period of time? You may be paying them, but it may take six months, eight months, 12 months. What's the time frame with which they're being paid now? If I submit my bill and I'm a provider, as of today, when will I get paid? Depending, again, we will, I can share with you the data that we have. I think there's No, no, I want to hear it update. now. I don't want to wait to share with us like you're sharing everything with all the questioners here. I'd like to know if you knew you were going to get a question on this. There's no question. So can you make a phone call while Senator Hannon is, uh, is answering the question, if I put a bill in today as a provider, when will I get paid? Can you make a phone call or find out if you don't know right now? It will depend, yes, but it will depend on the type of provider you are, who you're getting paid by, which part of the state, and that's the part well, of the problem. Well, tell me each type of provider and what the time frame is for each type of provider. Can you get that information? There can't be an infinite number. Oh, I'm happy to provide that information. Okay, and will you ask somebody to get it now so when we get done with the questions, I'll ask you for that information? Brad Hutton's in the audience, and we will ask him to uh, f follow up and see what he can get. And I'll be asking you that again. Uh, the other question that I, I really, you know, we, this, Brooklyn has a strong delegation in the state legislature. Uh, and I look at these numbers of the monies that have gone into saving Brooklyn hospitals. It is unbelievable. It is truly unbelievable. I know upstate in Syracuse, we uh, merged one hospital with another, so we have, we have three uh, hospitals rather than four, and they're cutting beds on a daily basis. Let me just read you something that's really caught my eye. Um, in recent months, employees at the Central Brooklyn Hospital have come to know a low level of it, uh, know a level of adversity uncommon, even in crisis-bound world of New York City health. As the hospitals repeatedly run out of money for even basic supplies, doctors at Interfaith Medical Center have pitched in to purchase everything from medicines and sutures for replacement. Interface is suffering more extremely from the woes, and it may be go out of business. This was in the New York Times, March 20th, 1989. And since that time, money has been thrown in and thrown in and thrown in to hospitals in distress. In 2010, there was a merger with Litch. Any logical human being would have seen that that was impossible that you are buying a dead hospital with millions of costs and making the rest of the system pay for that incompetence and inefficiency. There had to be a solution other than just create a bigger problem. So what I'm asking you now, and what bothers me most, and this is why I'm so agitated about this, the upstate, there's a world other than Brooklyn and other than New York City. And these hospitals are getting cut year after year after year. They consolidate. They uh, try to do things more efficiently, and rather than rewarded for their competence, additional money keeps flowing into these loss leaders without a plan that makes any sense or that you're willing or somebody's willing uh, to implement. So what do I tell people at the Upstate Medical Center, it's at uh, the other universities that have hospitals, tell, what do we tell them as to why this is a fair system? With the district, with the waiver, we are going to be tied to very specific deliverables by the federal government. Dollars will flow based on meeting objectives. Dollars will continue to flow if meeting objectives are continued to be met. 
So to the extent that the, there are objective criteria that the feds are going to hold us to, we're not going to get the $10 billion as a check. We're going to get money to make transformation, and as transformation proceeds, only then will more money flow. So this is an objective criteria outside of and New York's you, control, negotiated with the feds to transform systems, not save hospitals. Do you have the objectives right now? The, the, uh, Those are the, the objectives. The very specific high-level objectives have been agreed to. Reductions in hospital admissions. Right. Do you have something, something in writing to that effect? Absolutely. Well, no. That's the point. Is we haven't gotten the waiver or a commitment letter from right. them. When you get that, could I Within have 30 it? days. Okay. When you have it, would you get that to me? Now, what about those hospitals that I've been re referring to before that have done the right thing? And when the state says you got to consolidate, you got to operate more efficiently, you got to cut the beds, you got to do everything necessary to make you yourself more. Now they're done. They've done it. What do they do? Just sit by while more money is being spent? No, uh, good for them. And they shall continue to succeed. And they will be responsible. They will be recipients of the $1.2 billion. And there is more than enough hospital admissions that still need to be cut out of the rest of the state that they won't also have a chance at this money. The federal waiver will be statewide. So they have to show additional efficiencies to what they performed up to this point to get more dollars? There are vast underserved populations of behavioral health all that doesn't the answer state. my question. My question That's is an simply this. Of what the upstate's uh, folks can do to draw down funding. The specific question was the efficiencies that they've already accomplished to this point in time, they will not be rewarded for those under this new series of dollars. Is that correct? It's just what else they will do. I think that's not the, uh, the way I would phrase the question is slightly different. No, I, I, I'm asking the question. You, fr <laughs> you phrase the answer. You phrase the answer. It's not about being punished for doing good. They've also been recipients of billions of heel dollars over the last few years. So it's not, a, it's not fair to say that it's been a level fail, uh, playing field. On the other hand, they will have opportunities to draw down capital and other. I'm going to read, so I, I'm not going to read them, but the numbers here, you talk about the recipients of some dollars that pale in comparison to some of the hospitals we're talking about, pale in comparison. So the fact that they'll get some, I would like to see some regional balance and rewards for efficiencies for the hospitals that already did what they were supposed to do. No, that's not a question. That's just a point. Lastly, you know, we got people sitting here with signs, their arms are getting tired. You, you've got oil companies that are wanting the answers and so forth. Now, you say, I'm going to take as long as I'm going to take for public safety. God bless you. But at what point does the public get to know what information you have presently, what information you're gathering, what information uh, the else that you need to make that decision? Or do we just say, hey, as soon as he's ready, we'll just wait? It's a good question. And it is reality, a good question. Now, give me a good answer. <laughs> to the extent that we are taking a very aggressive approach to try to get as much information from every potential source, from experts, from my going out in the field, from, and, and trust me, people don't hold back with information. Those 130 papers, I've probably got them about seven times already. On the other hand, to the extent that we are getting this information, we're sifting through it as quickly as possible, you will have a full opportunity to look through all of the data. After you've made a decision? After I deliver my report. I am not making a decision. I am delivering a report to Commissioner Martens. And do you have, I know nobody wants to rush you, but, but you have a, every health commissioner has a longevity here, you know? And uh, it may be- What do you know that I don't know? I don't, <laughs> but, I've seen them come and go under good and bad circumstances, and one real bad circumstance. But in any event, do you have, you, you must have some estimate. You're a researcher. You're a researcher. You do these studies. You, that's your profession. You must have some time frame that you can probably give us as to when you might have enough information. Because you're right, the report you're waiting for may never happen. Just, just a ballpark. So I've been in trouble with uh, giving a time frame in the past. I yeah, will I think uh, it was pass weeks. on that. <laughs> I think it was last year you said weeks. That's but, right. uh, so that, but seriously, is it, do you have any idea? People want to know. Yeah. I don't, it's not in the near future where I can predict it. I can't say that okay. it's going to be this All month. All right. Somehow I expected that answer. Thank you. Next, Assemblyman Aubrey. 
And I can say good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, you had a far, uh, earlier discussion about school bell based health clinics, and, and uh, I was wondering what percentage of junior high and high school children in the state of New York have access to those clinics? Very small number. I would say in the single digits that today have access to school-based health centers. Uh, the reality is different parts need it differently. So to the extent where there is a, a, a suburb that uh, has very high uh, levels of affluence that everyone is getting commercial-based insurance, they may not need the same level of school-based health or they may not benefit relative to another area where they have no access and, and uh, the social determinants of health really are working against them. So it leads me to the question of whether or not the health department has a current uh, study of disparity relative to health care in the state. We have lots, we even have a, a work, uh, task force looking at disparities of health uh, across the state. And, and, and when we, was the last time they issued a report relative to that disparity? Uh, re related to obesity was just a few months ago. Uh, and to the extent that now with the Medicaid redesign, we are actually collecting data for the first time ever on race and ethnicity and language uh, across almost all of our programs. We'll have a much richer data set to address disparities across all our programs. And when will that be issued following our concerns about other reports that have to be issued? When will that come out? Well, the, the data is ongoingly collected on an ongoing basis and released regularly as well. So if you go today to healthdata.ny.gov, you will be able to get from our Sparks data set a lot of the data that you're interested in. Well, as legislators, we have to have information in order to make decisions about how you spend your money. Uh, how do we do that if we don't have uh, accurate information at the time that decisions are being made? Well, I'm happy to provide you with any information you'd like at any time uh, to the extent that we are actively interested and involved with uh, Yvonne Graham leading the charge in my office to work on issues related to disparities in minority health. Uh, this is something we take very seriously, something that the system has engaged in because they also understand the missed opportunities of keeping people healthy and lowering costs. It's our vision of the triple aim fundamentally requires addressing the social determinants of health and minority health. Uh, we're very interested in, in, in these issues. So we'll look forward to getting some contact with him and a communication. The other, I'd like to switch up to, what is the relationship between the health services provided by the correctional institution of this state and your department? Uh, I am actively involved in com communication with uh, folks in corrections on uh, uh, both in prison and in jails uh, on the health services provided. They have been leaders in telehealth, for example, which we can learn in the rest of the state from the uh, experience of uh, prisons and jails. On the other hand, there are also opportunities that we're working on right now where when folks are released, they, don't, they have a continuity of coverage through Medicaid. And, and so there are several issues we're working on together to and improve the continuity. The status of, care. of HIV and Hep C in our correctional facilities, uh, how is that going? And are we, that work that you indicate is going on relative to individuals who are released, the connection between uh, community health care providers and those who may be leaving those facilities with either one of those diseases? A absolutely, and we're very lucky and proud to have more work around hepatitis C recently, uh, not just a HIV and AIDS, uh, with uh, additional aggressive testing and now new treatments available for the very first time. Lots of folks have been waiting for these treatments for hepatitis C, and we look to expand treatment so that folks can get, uh, so many more will even be cured. Are individuals who with hep C and are incarcerated now receiving those treatments? My understanding is that these, the, the very newest treatments have just come out over the last few months. I'm not aware of whether they're being used or not. I anticipate that as part of any comprehensive program, they would be. I don't have the answer to that. Um, Perhaps Corrections does. In the past, I was aware that individuals who were incarcerated weren't being treated um, and were deferred treatment because of the problems with the nature of treatment. So would you be responsible? Would you be the responsible party to ensure that individuals who were suffering from hep C received that treatment while they were incarcerated as opposed to waiting until they were released? 
I mean, as a physician and as a doctor, as, as the state health commissioner, I'm looking to improve their care and I'll work with docs. I can't say that legally I'm responsible for their care, but I would do anything and everything in my power to make sure that they have the full spectrum of services that they need. Why wouldn't you be legally responsible as health commissioner for ensuring that our citizens, they are citizens, receive the same kind of quality of care anywhere they're located? I agree with you, absolutely. We should ensure the highest quality of care regardless of location. And more importantly, for that population, it's about continuity. They fall out of the system when they get discharged. They fall out of the system from prison to jail to community. And it's those continuities, those handoffs, which is where we're spending time to make I'm, sure. I'm concerned about the, the legality issue here. Do we need to change the law to make you the responsible health professional for the care of individuals who are incarcerated, if it is not now you. You are someone who is vetted by the legislature to have your job. The health commissioner or the health provider for docs is not so required. I believe I am responsible. I believe that I will continue to do what I have done, which is meet regularly with folks at all levels to continue to visit Rikers Island and other upstate facilities, as I have done, to continue to make sure that the gaps in care are addressed, if they exist, and that we can continue to be the national leaders in providing high quality health care across the continuum. Thank you very much. Just to only tell you that being a leader in this issue may not be so great considering the state of health care around the country for individuals who are incarcerated. So we want to be more than just a leader. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hannon to close. Thank you, Commissioner. Your patience is really admirable, and as is your eloquence. Uh, you're certainly not the Commissioner from two years ago. Uh, I have a number of different things to ask because this is a chance for the legislature to raise all the concerns, and uh, no matter who the governor is, unfortunately, we don't get the response uh, on, but for the budget cycle. I would note for the record, I was very pleased for a couple of things that you've been doing. Uh, the prevention agenda, which the department did on, own, on its own, I think sets great goals, great metrics, can lead the state to new things in terms of health. Uh, you're going, uh, governor's proposed the organ donation registry in a public-private partnership. We're already the least successful organ donation state in the nation, and we need to ramp that up, and I was glad you made that initiative. You've been very cooperative in regard to our, all of our questions and information about the Lyme disease and what the department is doing. It goes much beyond the research. Um, obviously, though, there's more to be done, which is why we have a task force. But there's a few other things that I have in no particular order. Um, I wanted to um, uh, back up uh, Senator Young's concerns about the uh, Lakeshore Hospital situation, the um, the, the Pittsburgh uh, medical system. I think that as you look at what the approaches that have been taken in Chautauqua County by an out-of-state medical system, each of the individual ones may be appropriate under our current statutes, but the sum total of it means we could lose control of the healthcare delivery in that area. And I don't know whether it's a bipartisan, by state that has to be approached, but I do know that I think it's imperative that we continue to, to search for what can be done uh, in, in, the, in our whole western part of the state. Um, the, uh, you made a note that uh, in regard to the exchange, that you said it's high quality and low cost and you might join in a few years. I would tell you not yet. Senator Golden was much restrained. We've had two round, a round table and a hearing in regard to how the exchange is rolling out, and people are really at a loss. At a loss for the money they didn't expect to pay, at a loss for the doctors they don't feel they can access anymore, or they don't even know this yet, what drugs they can get. Um, the metrics of this are really been set by the federal government, and in fact, some of the enrollment that's been, hind that's been impeded uh, New York has been that they have not, they don't have a Spanish website. Now, there's information in Spanish, but if you want to go through and enroll, that's not there. 
And given our population of people who speak Spanish, and probably there's 22 other major languages that ought to be addressed, um, we really need to move forward, and it's, they, are the, they are the bottleneck on that. Um, basic health plan. Uh, Senator Kruger raised this. I would say the outside studies that were done were done on different uh, foundation and suppositions. I would look for a lot more serious work as to whether or not there's savings that can be made and there's better health care. We've been very supportive in the Senate Republicans to advance increased coverage, but I'm not convinced on this. Despite the wonderful name, Basic Health Plan, it's not so basic, it's not so simple, and it's very complicated. We certainly want to get that care to the population affected. I'm not so sure this formula is the way to do it. Um, and the numbers to date, they've had to change because federal government's changed it, and we re have to go back and take a hard look at that. The um, $1.2 billion. I, I don't want to say this. I don't want to throw a wet blanket on the situation, but I would hope that if the federal waiver doesn't come through, that we would still be able to have a capital program in the state to provide uh, monies for the uh, hospitals that need it. And I don't mean um, just to go to the traditional list of uh, Brookdale, Interfaith, Kingsbrook, uh, Litch, and, uh, and University Hospital at Brooklyn. We obviously have hospitals throughout the state. And that's why last year we championed critical access hospitals under the VAP program. There was an agreement for $5 million, but not a nickel of that has flowed. And we have hospitals North Country, which you've had a commission on, up and down the Hudson uh, River, um, western part of New York, not only Chautauqua, but up in Erie. So th there is a need to really address this all over the state, as well as address what you just talked about before, the public perception of when you have a, if you get a waiver and you cut down hospital admissions, you're not gonna need buildings that are empty uh, and what will happen to all of that. The um, one thing we haven't talked about at all today is the impact on the healthcare system if the proposed closure of psychiatric hospitals is carried out. The, I have only seen some partial plans. I am told there's money that's gonna follow the patients, but I haven't seen anything concrete. I think anything, any action would be far too premature. And especially in looking at the different areas affected, I don't know what's gonna to happen to the safety nets for those who need psychiatric care, especially on an acute basis, especially children, um, because to a person, anecdotally, but more than just a few, ask hospitals, are you prepared? Do you have capacity? Can you do anything? And they all say, we do not have the capacity to do this. And so we've been marrying the mental health system with the health system, both under Medicaid and combined services. Look at what we're gonna do for the new proposed, the HARPs and things like that, is, and behavioral health plans. But the whole discussion in regard to psychiatric hospitals is, a, is as if the regular physical health system doesn't exist. And it's, it's, it's mind boggling. Global cap. I wanna keep coming back to that. I'm gonna keep coming back to that. Um, we don't know, we need to know exactly how it works, who makes the decisions, a debate on the policy as to how much the increase is gonna be, who gets the money from the increase, and the fact is there's some money under the global cap that's being moved into the general budget. 